from family and friends. Kenji Watanabe, Patrick and Benji were his three groomsmen. Mother, I feel nauseous, Ellie said soon after they were all gathered in the dressing room. I'll be so embarrassed if I throw up on my wedding dress. Should I try to eat something? Nicole had anticipated this situation. She handed Ellie a banana and some yoghurt, assuring her daughter that it was completely normal to feel queasy before such a big event. Nicole's uneasiness about the day increased as time passed, and Katie did not show up. With everything in order in the bride's dressing room, she decided to cross the hall to talk to Patrick. The men had finished dressing before Nicole knocked on their door. "'How is the mother of the bride?' Judge Mishkin asked when she entered. The grand old judge was going to perform the wedding ceremony. "'A little spooked,' Nicole answered with a wan smile. She found Patrick in the back of the room, adjusting Benji's clothes. "'How do I look?' Benji asked his mother as she approached. "'Very, very handsome.' Nicole replied to her beaming son. "'Have you talked to Katie this morning?' she asked Patrick. "'No,' he said. "'But I reconfirmed the time with her, as you requested, just last night. "'Is she not here yet?' Nicole shook her head. It was already 6.15, only 45 minutes before the ceremony was scheduled to start. She walked out in the hall to use the phone, but the smell of cigarette smoke told her that Katie had finally arrived. "'Just think, little sister,' Katie was saying in a loud voice as Nicole crossed back to the bride's dressing room. Tonight you get to have your first sex. Oui, I bet the thought just drives that gorgeous body of yours absolutely wild. Katie, Eponine said, I don't think that's entirely appropriate. Nicole walked into the room and Eponine fell silent. Why, mother, Katie said, how beautiful you look. I had forgotten that there was a woman lurking behind those judges' robes. Katie expelled smoke into the air and took a drink from the champagne bottle on the counter beside her. So, here we are, she said with a flourish, about to witness the marriage of my baby sister. Stop it, Katie, you've had too much to drink. Nicole's voice was cold and hard. She picked up the champagne and Katie's pack of cigarettes. Just finish dressing and stop the clowning. You can have these back after the ceremony. Okay, judge, whatever you say, Katie said inhaling deeply and blowing out smoke rings. She grinned at the other ladies. Then, as Katie reached for the wastebasket to flick the ash off her cigarette, she lost her balance. Katie fell painfully against the counter, hitting several open bottles of cosmetics before landing on the floor in a mess. Eponine and Ellie both rushed over to help her. Are you all right? Ellie asked. Watch out for your dress, Ellie, Nicole said, looking disapprovingly at Katie, sprawled on the floor. Nicole grabbed some paper towels and began cleaning up what Katie had spilled. "'Yeah, Ellie,' Katie said sarcastically a few seconds later, when she was again standing up. "'Watch out for that dress. You want to be absolutely spotless when you marry your double murderer.' Nobody breathed in the room. Nicole was livid. She approached Katie and then stood directly in front of her. "'Apologize to your sister,' she ordered. "'I will not.' Katie replied defiantly, just moments before Nicole's open hand landed on her cheek. Tears burst into Katie's eyes. Aha, uh -huh, she said, wiping at her face. It's New Eden's most famous slapper. Only two days after resorting to physical violence in Central City Square, she strikes her own daughter in a replay of her most famous deed. Mother, don't, please, Ellie interrupted, fearing that Nicole would slap Katie again. Nicole turned around, and looked at the distraught bride. I'm sorry, she mumbled. That's right, said Katie angrily. Tell her you're sorry. I'm the one you hit, judge. Remember me? Your older, unmarried daughter? The one you called disgusting only three weeks ago yesterday? You told me that my friends were sleazy and immoral. Are those the exact words? Yet your precious Ellie, that paragon of virtue, you hand her over to a double murderer, with another murderer as a bridesmaid to boot. All of the women realised at roughly the same moment that Katie was not just drunk and truculent. She was deeply disturbed. Her wild eyes condemned them all as she continued her rambling diatribe. She is drowning, Nicole said to herself, and crying desperately for help. Not only have I ignored her cries, I have pushed her deeper into the water. Katie, Nicole said quietly, I'm sorry. I acted foolishly and without thought. She walked toward her daughter with her arms outstretched. No, Katie replied, pushing her mother's arms away. No, 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 I don't want your pity. She moved back toward the door. In fact, 
I don't want to be in this goddamn wedding. I don't belong here. Good luck, little sister. Tell me someday how the handsome doctor is in bed. Katie turned around and stumbled through the door. Both Ellie and Nicole were silently weeping as she left. Nicole tried to concentrate on the wedding, but her heart was heavy after the untoward scene with Katie. She helped Ellie put on her makeup again, repeatedly chastising herself for having responded angrily to Katie. Just before the ceremony started, Nicole returned to the men's dressing room and informed them that Katie had decided not to be in the wedding. She then peeked briefly at the gathering crowd, noticing that there were about a dozen biots already seated. My goodness, Nicole thought. We weren't specific enough in the invitations. It was not abnormal for some of the colonists to bring their Lincolns or Tiassos with them to special functions, especially if they had children. Before she returned to the bride's dressing room, Nicole fretted momentarily about whether or not there would be enough seats for everybody. Moments later, or so it seemed, the bridal party was gathered on the stage around Judge Mishkin, and the music announced the arrival of the bride. Like everyone else, Nicole turned around and looked to the back of the theatre. There was her gorgeous youngest daughter, resplendent in her white dress with the red trim, coming down the aisle on Richard's arm. Nicole fought back the tears, but when she saw big drops glistening on the cheeks of the bride, she could control herself no longer. I love you, my Ellie, Nicole said to herself. How I hope that you will be happy. Judge Mishkin had prepared an eclectic ceremony at the couple's request. It praised the love of a man and a woman, and talked about how important their bond was in the proper creation of a family. His words counseled tolerance, patience, and selflessness. He offered a non-denominational prayer, invoking God to call forth from the bride and groom that compassion and understanding that ennobles the human species. The ceremony was short, but elegant. Dr. Turner and Ellie exchanged rings and recited their vows with strong, positive voices. They turned to Judge Mishkin, and he placed their hands together. With the authority granted me by the colony of New Eden, I pronounce Robert Turner and Eleanor Wakefield, husband and wife. As Dr. Turner was gently lifting Ellie's veil for the traditional kiss, a shot rang out, followed an instant later by another. Judge Mishkin pitched forward on the bridal couple, blood spurting from his forehead. Kenji Watanabe collapsed beside him. Eponine dove between the bridal couple and the guests as third and fourth shots were heard. Everyone was screaming. There was chaos in the theatre. Two more shots followed in rapid succession. In the third row, Max Puckett finally disarmed the Lincoln Biot that had been the gunman. Max had turned around almost instantly, as soon as he had heard the first shot, and had leapt over the chairs a second later. However, the Lincoln Biot, who had risen from its seat at the word wife, fired its automatic gun a total of six times before Max subdued it completely. Blood was all over the stage. Nicole crawled over and examined Governor Watanabe. He was already dead. Dr. Turner cradled Judge Mishkin as the gracious old man closed his eyes for the final time. The third bullet had apparently been intended for Dr. Turner, for Eponine had caught it in her side after her frantic dive to save the bride and groom. Nicole picked up the microphone that had fallen with Judge Mishkin. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a terrible, terrible tragedy. Please do not panic. I believe there is no more danger. Please, just hold your places until we can tend to the injured. The final four bullets had not done too much damage. Eponine was bleeding, but her condition was not critical. Max had struck the Lincoln just before it fired the fourth bullet, almost certainly saving Nicole's life, since that particular bullet had missed her by only centimetres. Two of the guests had been grazed by the final shots as the Lincoln was falling. Richard joined Max and Patrick, who were restraining the killer biot. He won't answer a single goddamn question, Max said. Richard looked at the Lincoln's shoulder. The biot was number 333. Take him into the back, Richard said. I want to look at him later. On the stage, Nai Watanabe was sitting on her knees, holding the head of her beloved Kenji on her lap. Her body was trembling with deep, desperate sobs. Beside her, the twins Galileo and Kepler were wailing with fright. Ellie, blood all over her wedding dress, was trying to comfort the little boys. Dr. Turner was attending to Eponine. An ambulance should be here in just a few minutes, he said after dressing her wound. He kissed her on the forehead. 
There's no way that Ellie and I can ever thank you for what you did. Nicole was down with the guests, making certain that neither of the bystanders who had been struck by bullets was seriously injured. She was about to return to the microphone and tell everyone that they could begin to leave when a hysterical colonist burst into the theatre. An Einstein has gone mad, he shouted before surveying the scene in front of him. Ulanov and Judge Ianella are both dead. We should both leave, and now, Richard said. But even if you won't, Nicole, I am going to go. I know too much about the 300 series biots and what Nakamura's people have done to change them. They'll be after me tonight or in the morning. All right, darling, Nicole replied. I understand, but I cannot go. Someone must stay to take care of the family and to fight Nakamura, even if it's hopeless. We must not submit to his tyranny. It was three hours after the aborted end of Ellie's wedding. Panic was sweeping the colony. The television had just reported that five or six biots had simultaneously gone mad and that as many as eleven of New Eden's most prominent citizens had been killed. Luckily, the Kawabata biot performing the concerts in Vegas had failed in its attack on gubernatorial candidate Ian McMillan and noted industrialist Toshio Nakamura. Bullshit, Richard had said as he had watched. That was just another part of their plan. He was certain that the entire assassination activity had been planned and orchestrated by the Nakamura camp. Moreover, Richard had no doubt that he and Nicole had also been intended targets. He was convinced that the day's events would result in a totally different New Eden under the control of Nakamura, with Ian Macmillan as his puppet governor. "'Won't you at least say goodbye to Patrick and Benji?' Nicole asked. "'I'd better not,' Richard answered. "'Not because I don't love them, but because I'm afraid I might change my mind.' "'Are you going to use the emergency exit?' Nicole said. Richard nodded. "'They'd never let me out the normal way.' While he was checking his diving apparatus, Nicole came into the study. It was just reported on the news that people are smashing their biots all over the colony. One of the colonists interviewed said the entire mass murder was part of an alien plot. Great, Richard said grimly. The propaganda has already begun. He packed as much food and water as he thought he could comfortably carry. When he was ready, he held Nicole tightly against him for over a minute. There were tears in both their eyes as he departed. Do you know where you're going? Nicole asked softly. More or less, Richard answered as he stood in the back door. I'm not telling you, of course, so you can't be implicated. I understand, she said. They both heard something at the front of the house, and Richard dashed out into the backyard. The train to Lake Shakespeare was not running. The Garcia, operating an earlier train on the same track, had been terminated by a group of angry colonists, and the whole system had shut down. Richard began walking toward the eastern side of Lake Shakespeare. As he trudged along, carrying his heavy diving equipment and backpack, he had the feeling that he was being followed. Twice Richard thought he saw someone out of the corner of his eye, but when he stopped and looked around, he saw nothing. Finally, he reached the lake. It was after midnight. He took one final look at the lights of the colony and began to put on his diving apparatus. Richard's blood ran cold as a Garcia came out of the bushes while he was undressing. He expected to be killed. After several long seconds, the Garcia spoke. Are you Richard Wakefield? it asked. Richard did not move or say anything. If you are, the Biot said at length, I am bringing a message from your wife. She says she loves you, and Godspeed. Richard took a long, slow breath. Tell her I love her also, he said. The Trial Chapter One in the deepest part of Lake Shakespeare there was an open entrance to a long submarine channel that ran under both the village of Beauvoir and the habitat wall. During the design of New Eden, Richard, who had had considerable practical experience with contingency engineering, had stressed the importance of an emergency exit from the colony. "'But what would you need it for?' the eagle had asked. "'I don't know,' Richard had said. "'But unforeseen situations often arise in life.' A robust engineering design always has contingency protection. Richard swam carefully through the tunnel, slowing down every several minutes to check his air supply. When he reached the end, he moved through a series of locks that left him eventually in a dry subterranean passage. 
He walked for about a hundred metres before he removed his diving apparatus and stored it at the side of the tunnel. When he reached the exit, which was at the eastern edge of the enclosed area that included both the habitats in the northern hemicylinder of Rama, Richard pulled his thermal jacket out of his waterproof pack. Even though he realised that nobody could possibly know where he was, Richard opened the round door in the passage ceiling very cautiously. Then he eased out into the central plain. So far, so good, he thought, breathing a sigh of relief. Now for plan B. For four days, Richard remained on the eastern side of the plain. Using his excellent small binoculars, he could see the lights indicating activities around the control center, the Avalon region, or the second habitat probe site. As Richard had anticipated, there were search parties out in the interhabitat region for a day or two, but only one group came in his direction, and they were easy for him to avoid. His eyes grew accustomed to what he had thought was total darkness in the central plain. Actually, there was a small amount of background light, due to reflection off the surfaces of Rama. Richard conjectured that the source or sources of the light must be in the southern hemicylinder, or on the other side of the far wall of the second habitat. Richard wished that he could fly, so that he would be able to soar over the walls and move freely in the vastness of the cylindrical world. The existence of the very low levels of reflected light piqued his interest in the rest of Rama. Was there still a cylindrical sea to the south of the barrier wall? Did New York still exist as an island in that sea? And what, if anything, was in the southern hemicylinder, a region even larger than the one that contained the two northern habitats? On the fifth day after his escape, Richard awoke from an especially disturbing dream about his father and started to walk in the direction of what he now called the avian habitat. He had shifted his sleeping pattern to be directly opposite the diurnal cycle in New Eden, so that the time inside the colony was about seven in the evening. He assumed that all the humans who were working at the probe site had already finished for the day. When he was about half a kilometre away from the opening in the avian habitat wall, Richard stopped to verify, using his binoculars, that there were no longer any people in the region. He then sent Falstaff to decoy the site watchman Biot. Richard was not certain how uniform the passage was that led into the second habitat. He had drawn an eighty centimetre square on the floor of his study, and had convinced himself that he should be able to crawl through it. But what if the size of the passage was irregular? We'll find out soon enough, Richard said to himself as he approached the site. Only one set of cables and instruments had been reinserted into the passage, so it was not difficult for Richard to clear them out. Falstaff had also been successful. Richard neither heard nor saw the watchman Biot. He threw his small pack into the opening, and then tried to climb in himself. It was impossible. He took off his jacket first, then his shirt, pants, and shoes. Wearing only his underwear and socks, Richard could barely fit into the passage. He tied his clothes together in a bundle, affixed them to the side of his pack, and squeezed into the opening. It was a very slow crawl. Richard inched forward on his stomach, using his hands and elbows, pushing his pack in front of him. He brushed his body against the walls and the ceiling with every movement. He stopped, his muscles already beginning to tire, after he was fifteen minutes into the tunnel. The other side was still almost forty metres away. As he rested, Richard realised that his elbows, knees, and even the top of his balding head were already scraped and bleeding. Retrieving bandages from his pack was out of the question. Just rolling over on his back and looking behind him was a monumental effort in the cramped quarters. He also realised that he was very cold. While he had been crawling, the energy required to make forward progress had kept him warm. Once he had stopped, however, his exposed body had chilled rapidly. Having so much of his body resting against cold metallic surfaces did not help either. His teeth began to chatter. Richard pressed on slowly, painfully, for another fifteen minutes. Then his right hip cramped, and in his body's involuntary response he smashed his head against the top of the passage. A little woozy from the blow, he became alarmed when he felt blood running down the side of his head. There was no light in front of him. The dim illumination that had allowed him to monitor Prince Hal's progress had vanished. He struggled to roll over and see behind him. It was dark everywhere, and he was becoming cold again. Richard felt his head and tried to determine how severely he had been cut. His panic started when he realized that he was still hemorrhaging.
Until that moment, he had not felt claustrophobic. Now, all of a sudden, wedged into a dark passage that Richard could feel pressing against him from all sides, he felt as if he could not breathe. The walls seemed to be crushing him. He could not control himself. He screamed. In less than half a minute, some kind of light was being shone into the passage from his rear. He heard the funny English accent of the Garcia Biot, but could not understand what it was saying. Almost certainly, he thought, it is filing an emergency report. I'd better move quickly. He began to crawl again, ignoring his fatigue, his bleeding head, and his skinless knees and elbows. Richard estimated that he had only ten metres to go, fifteen at the most, when the passage seemed to shrink. He couldn't get through. He strained every muscle, but it was useless. He was definitely stymied. While he was trying to find a different crawling position that might be more geometrically favourable, he heard a soft pitter-patter approaching him from the direction of the avian habitat. Moments later, they were all over him. Richard spent five seconds of absolute terror before his mind informed him that the tickling sensations he was feeling all over his skin were caused by the leggies. He remembered seeing them on television. Little spherical creatures, about two centimetres in diameter, attached to six radially symmetrical, multi-jointed legs, almost ten centimetres long if fully extended. One had stopped and was directly on his face, its legs straddling his nose and mouth. He tried to brush it off but bumped his head again. Richard began squirming around to shake off the leggies and somehow managed to make forward progress. With the leggies still all over him, he crawled the final metres to the exit. He reached the outer avian annulus just as he heard a human voice behind him. Hello? Is there somebody in there? it said. Whoever you are, please identify yourself. We are here to help you. A strong searchlight illuminated the passage. Richard now discovered he had another problem. His exit was one metre above the floor of the annulus. I should have crawled backwards, he thought, and dragged my pack and clothes. It would have been much easier. It was too late for hindsight. With his pack and clothes on the floor below him, and a second human voice now asking questions from behind, Richard continued to crawl forward until his body was halfway out of the passage. When he felt himself falling, Richard put his hands behind his head, tucked his chin against his chest, and tried to make himself into a ball. He then bounced and rolled into the avian annulus. As he was falling, the leggies jumped off and disappeared in the darkness. The lights the humans were shining into the passage reflected off the inner walls of the annulus. After first ascertaining that he was not injured, and that his head was no longer seriously bleeding, Richard picked up his belongings and hobbled two hundred metres to the left. He stopped just under the porthole where Prince Hal had been captured by the avian. Despite his fatigue, Richard wasted no time scaling the wall. As soon as he had finished dressing and tending to his wounds, he started the ascent. He was certain that a deployable camera would soon be pushed into the annulus to look for him. Fortunately, there was a small ledge in front of the porthole that was large enough to accommodate Richard. He sat there while he cut through the metal mesh screen and then pushed it aside. He expected the leggies to show up at any minute, but he remained alone. Richard didn't see or hear anything from the habitat interior. Although he twice tried to summon Prince Hal on his radio, there was no response to his call. Richard stared into the complete darkness of the avian habitat. What is in there? he wondered. The atmosphere in the interior, he reasoned, must be the same as that in the annulus, because air was allowed to circulate freely back and forth. Richard had just decided to pull out his flashlight for a look into the habitat interior when he heard sounds below and behind him. Seconds later he saw a light beam coming in his direction, down on the floor of the annulus. He scrunched himself over toward the interior of the habitat as far as he dared, to avoid the light, and listened carefully to the sounds. It's the deployable camera, he thought, but it has limited range. It cannot operate without the tether. Richard sat very still. What do I do now, he said to himself when it became apparent that the light attached to the camera was continuing to sweep the same area below the porthole. They must have seen something. If I turn on my flashlight and there's any reflection, they'll know where I am. He dropped a small object from his pack into the habitat to ensure that its floor level was the same as the annulus. He heard nothing. Richard tried another, slightly larger object, but still there was no sound of it striking the floor.
His heart rate surged as his mind told him that the floor of the habitat interior was far below the floor of the annulus. He recalled the basic structure of Rama, with its thick external shell, and realized that the habitat bottom could be several hundred meters below where he was sitting. Richard leaned over and stared again into the void. The deployable camera suddenly stopped moving, and its light remained focused on a specific spot in the annulus. Richard guessed that something must have fallen out of his pack while he was hurriedly hobbling from the passage to the area underneath the porthole. He knew that other lights and cameras would be coming soon. In his mind's eye, Richard envisioned being captured and taken back to New Eden. He did not know specifically which colony laws he had broken, but he knew that he had committed many violations. A deep resentment coursed through him as he contemplated spending months or even years in detention. Under no circumstances, he told himself, will I let that happen. He reached down the inside wall of the habitat to ascertain if there were enough irregularities to find places to put his feet and hands. Satisfied that it was not an impossible descent, he fumbled in his pack for his climbing line and anchored one end of it to the hinges supporting the mesh door. Just in case I should slip, he told himself. A second light was now in the annulus behind him. Richard eased himself into the habitat, with the line wrapped securely around his waist. He did not repel, but he did use the line for occasional support while he was groping for footholds in the dark. The climb was not technically difficult. There were many small ledges on which Richard could place his feet. Down and down he went. When he estimated that he had descended sixty or seventy metres, Richard decided to stop and take his flashlight out of his pack. He was not comforted when he shone the light down the wall. He still could not see the bottom. What he could see, maybe fifty more metres below him, was very diffuse, like a cloud or even fog. Great, thought Richard sarcastically. That's just great. Another thirty metres, and he had reached the end of his climbing line. Richard could already feel the moisture from the fog. By now he was extremely tired. Since he was not willing to give up the security of the line, he backtracked up the wall a few metres, wrapped the line around himself several times, and went to sleep with his body pressed against the wall. Chapter 2 His dreams were very strange. Often he was falling, head over heels, down, down, and never hitting a bottom. In the last dream before Richard awakened, Toshio Nakamura and two oriental toughs were interrogating him in a small room with white walls. When he woke up, Richard did not know where he was for several seconds. His first movement was to pull his right cheek away from the metallic surface of the wall. A few moments later, after Richard recalled that he had gone to sleep in a vertical position on the wall in the interior of the avian habitat, he switched on his flashlight and looked down. His heart skipped a beat when he saw that the fog was no longer there. Instead, he could see the wall extending far, far below, and what appeared to be water where the wall finally terminated. He leaned his head back and gazed above him. Since he knew he was about ninety meters below the porthole, the climbing line was a hundred meters long, he estimated that the distance down to the water was about two hundred and fifty more meters. His knees became weak as his brain began to comprehend fully his predicament. When Richard started to untangle himself from the extra loops he had made in the line before going to sleep, he noticed that his arms and hands were trembling. He had a tremendous desire to flee, to ascend again to the porthole, and then leave this alien world altogether. No, Richard told himself, fighting his instinctive reaction. Not yet. Only if there are no other viable options. He decided he would first have something to eat. Very gingerly, Richard freed himself from part of the line and pulled some food and water out of his pack. Then he turned partially around and pointed his light into the interior of the habitat. Richard thought he could see shapes and forms off in the distance, but he couldn't be certain. It could just be my imagination, he thought. When he was finished eating, he checked his food and water supplies and then made a mental list of his options. It's all very simple, Richard said to himself. No. It's all very simple, Richard said to himself with a nervous laugh. I can return to New Eden and become a convict, maybe even a corpse, or I can give up the security of my line and continue on down the wall. He paused a moment, glancing up and down. Or oh, I can stay here and hope for a miracle, 
Remembering that an avian had come quickly when Prince Hal had shrieked, Richard began to shout. After two or three minutes he stopped shouting and started to sing. He sang intermittently for most of an hour. He began with tunes from his days at Cambridge University, and then switched to songs that had been popular during his lonely teenage years. Richard was astonished by how well he remembered the lyrics. The memory is an amazing device, he mused to himself. What accounts for its selective reliability? Why can I remember almost all the words of these dumb songs from my adolescence, and virtually nothing from my Odyssey and Rama? Richard was reaching into his pack for another drink of water, when there was suddenly light in the habitat. He was so startled that his feet slipped off the wall, and all his weight was on the climbing line for a few seconds. The light was not blinding, as it had been when dawn had arrived in Rama too while he was riding the chairlift, but it was light nevertheless. As soon as Richard was again secure, he surveyed the world that was now unveiled in front of him. The source of the illumination was a great hooded ball hanging from the ceiling of the habitat. Richard estimated that the ball was about four kilometres away from him, and roughly one kilometre directly above the top of the most prominent structure in sight, a large brown cylinder in the geometrical centre of the habitat. An opaque hood covered the top three-fourths of the glowing ball, so most of its light was directed downward. The basic design principle of the habitat interior was radial symmetry. At its centre was the upright brown cylinder, looking as if it was made from soil, that probably measured fifteen hundred metres from top to bottom. Richard, of course, could only see one side of the structure, but from its curvature he estimated that its diameter was between two and three kilometres. There were no windows or doors on the outside of the cylinder. No light escaped anywhere from its interior. The only pattern on the side of the structure was a set of widely spaced curved lines, each one of which started at the top and ran entirely around the cylinder, before reaching the bottom directly underneath its point of origination. The bottom of the cylinder was sitting on an elevated plateau at approximately the same altitude as the porthole through which Richard had entered. Circumscribing the cylinder was an array of small white structures that formed a ring about three hundred metres in diameter. The two northern quadrants, Richard had entered the avian habitat through the north porthole, of this ring were identical. Each quadrant had fifty or sixty buildings that were laid out in the same pattern. Richard assumed from the symmetry that the other two quadrants would conform to the same design. A thin circular canal, maybe seventy or eighty metres wide, surrounded the ring of structures. Both the canal and the white buildings were located on the plateau at the same altitude as the bottom of the brown cylinder. Outside the canal, however, a large region of what appeared to be growing things, primarily green in colour, occupied most of the rest of the habitat. The ground in this green region sloped monotonically down from the canal to the shores of the four hundred metre wide moat that was just inside the interior wall. The four apparently identical quadrants in the green region were further subdivided into four sections each, which Richard, basing his designations on earth analogues, called jungle, forest, grassland, and desert. For about ten minutes Richard stared quietly at the vast panorama. Because the level of illumination dropped in direct proportion to the distance from the cylinder, he could not see the closer regions any more clearly than those in the distance. Nevertheless, the details were still impressive. The more he looked, the more new things he noticed. There were small lakes and rivers in the green region, an occasional tiny island in the moat, and what looked like roads between the white buildings. Of course, he found himself thinking, why would I have expected otherwise? We have reproduced a small earth in New Eden. This must represent in some way the home planet of the avians. His last thought reminded him that both Nicole and he had been convinced from the beginning that the avians were no longer, if they had ever been, a high-technology spacefaring species. Richard pulled out his binoculars and studied the brown cylinder in the distance. What secrets do you hold? he wondered, thrilled momentarily by the possibilities for adventure and discovery. Richard next searched the skies for some sign of the avians. He was disappointed. He thought he saw flying creatures once or twice at the top of the brown cylinder, but the flecks flitted in and out of his binocular vision so quickly that he couldn't be absolutely certain. Everywhere else he looked, in all parts of the green region, in the neighbourhood of the white buildings, even in the moat, he saw no evidence of movement. There was no positive indication that anything was alive in the avian habitat. The light disappeared after four hours, 
and Richard was again left in the dark in the middle of the vertical wall. He checked his thermometer, including its historical database. The temperature had not varied more than half a degree from 26 degrees centigrade since he had entered the habitat. Impressive thermal control, Richard said to himself. But why so stringent? Why use so much of the power resource to keep a fixed temperature? As the darkness stretched into hours, Richard became impatient. Even though he regularly rested each set of muscles by temporarily supporting himself in different ways with his line, his body was slowly wearing out. It was time for him to consider taking some action. Reluctantly, he decided that it would be foolhardy for him to abandon the line and descend to the moat. What would I do when I reach there anyway, he thought. Swim across? And then what? I'd still have to turn around if I didn't find food immediately. He began to climb slowly toward the porthole. While he was resting about halfway to the exit, he thought he heard something very faint off to his right. Richard stopped and quietly reached into his pack for his receiver set. With a minimum of motion, he turned the gain up to its highest level and put on the earphones. At first he heard nothing, but after several minutes he picked up a sound below him, coming from the moat. It was impossible to identify exactly what he was hearing. It could have been several boats moving through the water, but there was no doubt that some kind of activity was occurring down there. Was that a faint flapping of wings as well? Again, somewhere off to his right. With no warning, Richard suddenly screamed at the top of his lungs, and then truncated the scream abruptly. The flurry of wing sounds died out quickly, but for a second or two they were unmistakable. Richard was exultant. I know you're there, he shouted gleefully. I know you're watching me. He had a plan. It was certainly a long shot, but it was definitely better than nothing. Richard checked his food and water, assured himself that they were both marginally adequate, and took a deep breath. It's now or never, he thought. He practiced descending without relying on the line for support. It made progress more difficult, but he could do it. When he reached the end of the line, Richard unharnessed himself and shone his light down the wall. At least as far as the top of the fog, which by now had returned, there were plenty of ledges available. He continued down very carefully, admitting to himself that he was frightened. Several times he thought he could hear his own heart beating in his earphones. Now, if I'm right, Richard thought when he descended into the fog, I'm going to have company down here. The moisture made the descent doubly difficult. Once he slipped and almost fell, but he managed to recover. Richard stopped at a point where his hand and footholds were unusually solid. He estimated that he was about fifty metres above the moat. I'll wait now until I hear something. They'll have to come closer in the fog. In a short while, he heard the wings again. This time it sounded as if it was a pair of avians. Richard stood where he was for over an hour until the fog began to thin. Several more times he heard the wings of his observers. He had planned to wait until it was light again to descend all the way to the water, but when the fog lifted and the light still did not return, Richard began to worry about the time. He started down the wall in the dark. About ten metres above the moat he heard his observers fly away. Two minutes later the interior of the avian habitat was again illuminated. Richard wasted no time. His plan was simple. Based on the boat noises that he had heard in the dark, Richard assumed that there was something happening in the moat that was critical to the avians or whoever it was that lived in the brown cylinder. If not, he reasoned, why had they proceeded with the activity, knowing that he might hear it? If they had postponed it for even a few hours, he would almost certainly have been gone from the habitat. Richard intended to enter the moat. If the avians feel threatened in any way, he reasoned, they will take some action. If not, I will immediately begin my ascent and take my chances in New Eden. Just before he eased into the water, Richard took off his shoes and with some difficulty put them into his waterproof pack. At least they wouldn't be wet if he had to climb out. Seconds later, as soon as he was completely in the water, a pair of avians flew at him from where they had been hiding in the green region directly across the moat. They were frantic. They jabbered and shrieked and acted as if they were going to tear Richard apart with their talons. He was so ecstatic that his plan had worked that he virtually ignored their displays. The avians hovered over him and tried to herd him back to the wall. He trod water and studied them closely.
These two were slightly different from the ones that he and Nicole had encountered in Rama II. These avians had the velvet body coverings, just like the others, but the velvet was purple. The single ring around each of their necks was black. They were also smaller, perhaps they're younger, Richard thought, than the earlier avians, and much more frenetic. One of the creatures actually touched Richard's cheek with its talon when he didn't move swiftly enough to the wall. At length, Richard did climb up onto the wall, barely out of the water, but that did not seem to appease the avians. Almost immediately the two large birds began taking turns flying narrow patterns up the wall, showing Richard that they wanted him to ascend. When he didn't move, they became more and more frantic. "'I want to go with you,' Richard said, pointing at the brown cylinder in the distance. Each time he repeated his hand signal, the huge creatures shrieked and jabbered and flew up in the direction of the porthole. The avians were becoming frustrated, and Richard started to worry that perhaps they might attack him. Suddenly, he had a brilliant idea. But can I remember the entry code? He asked himself excitedly. It's been so many years. When he reached in his pack, the avians flew away immediately. That proves, Richard said out loud as he switched on his beloved portable computer, that the leggies are your electronic observers. How else could you have possibly known that human beings may keep weapons in packs like these? He punched five letters on the keyboard, and then smiled broadly when the display activated. Come here, Richard said, waving at the pair of avians who had retreated almost to the other side of the moat. Come here, he repeated. I have something to show you. He held up the monitor and displayed the complex computer graphic that he had used many years before in Rama II to convince the creatures to carry Nicole and him across the cylindrical sea. It was an elegant graphic showing three avians carrying two human figures across a body of water in a harness. The two giant birds approached tentatively. That's it, Richard said to himself excitedly. Come over here and take a good look. Chapter 3 Richard did not know exactly how long he had been living in the dim room. He had lost track of time soon after they had taken his pack away from him. His routine had been the same day after day. He slept in the corner of the room. Whenever he awakened, whether from a nap or a long sleep, two avians would enter his room from the corridor and hand him a manna melon to eat. He knew they came through the locked door at the end of the corridor, but if he tried to sleep near the door they simply denied him his food. It had been an easy lesson for Richard to learn. Every other day or so a different pair of avians would enter his prison and clean up his wastes. His clothes were rank, and Richard knew that he was unbearably filthy, but he had not been able to communicate to his captors that he wanted a bath. He had been exultant in the beginning, when the two juvenile avians had finally approached close enough to watch the graphic, and then had made their first attempt to take the computer from him several minutes later, Richard had decided to program the display to repeat indefinitely. In less than an hour, the largest avian he had ever seen, one with a grey velvet body and three brilliant cherry-red rings around its neck, had returned with the two juveniles, and the three of them had picked Richard up in their talons. They had carried him across the moat, put him down temporarily in a desert area, and then, after a series of jabbers among the three of them, that must have been a discussion about the optimal way of carrying him, they had lifted him high into the air. It had been a breathtaking flight. The view that Richard had had of the landscape and the habitat had reminded him of a ride he had once taken in a hot air balloon in southern France. He had flown in the clutches of the avians all the way to the top of the brown cylinder, directly underneath the bright hooded ball. They had been met by a half-dozen additional avians, one holding Richard's computer, which was still repeating its graphics. Later they had been escorted down a wide vertical corridor into the interior of the cylinder. That first fifteen hours or so, Richard had been taken from one large group of avians to another. He had thought that his hosts were just introducing him to all the citizens of avian land. Assuming that there were not too many avians who attended more than one of the short jabber-and-shriek sessions, Richard estimated that there were about seven hundred individual birds. After his parade through the conference halls of the avian realm, Richard had been taken to a small room where the three-ringed avian and two of its associates, each large creatures as well, with three red neck rings, watched him day and night for about a week. During that time, Richard was allowed access to his computer and all the items in the pack. At the end of that observation period, however, they had taken away all his belongings and moved him to his prison. 
That must have been three months ago, give or take a week, Richard said to himself one day, as he began his twice-daily walk that was his primary regular exercise. The corridor outside his room was approximately two hundred meters long. He usually made eight complete laps, back and forth from the door at the end of the corridor to the rock wall just outside his room. And during this entire period there has not been one single visit from the leaders. So, the observation period must have been my trial, at least the avian equivalent. And was I found guilty of something? Is that why I have been restricted to this dingy cell? Richard's shoes were wearing out, and his clothes were already tattered. Since the temperature was comfortable, he conjectured that it must be twenty-six degrees Celsius everywhere in the avian habitat. He wasn't worried about being cold, but for many reasons he wasn't looking forward to being naked all the time after his clothes eventually disintegrated. He smiled to himself, remembering his modesty during the observation period. Taking a crap when three giant birds are watching your every move is certainly not an easy task. He had grown tired of eating manna melon for every meal, but at least it was nourishing. The liquid at the centre was refreshing, and the moist meat had a pleasant taste. But Richard longed for something different to eat. Even that synthetic stuff from the white room would be a welcome change, he had told himself several times. In his solitude, Richard's greatest challenge had been to retain his mental acumen. He had begun by doing mathematical problems in his head. More recently, worried that the sharpness of his memory had already decayed measurably because of his age, he had started to pass the time by reconstructing events and even entire major chronological segments of his life. Of particular interest to him during these memory exercises were the huge gaps associated with his odyssey in Rama II during the voyage from the Earth to the Node. Although it was difficult for Richard to recall many specific events from the Odyssey, eating the manna melon always evoked memory fragments from his long stay with the avians during that journey. Once, after a meal, he had suddenly recalled a large ceremony with many avians. He had remembered a fire in a dome-like structure and all the avians wailing in unison after the fire was over. Richard had been puzzled. He had not been able to remember anything about the context of the memory. Where did that take place? Was that just before I was captured by the octo spiders? He had wondered. But as usual, when he had tried to remember something about what he had experienced with the octo spiders, he had ended up with a whopping headache. Richard was thinking about his early odyssey again when, on the last lap of his daily walk, he passed underneath the solitary light in the corridor. He looked in front of him and saw that the door to his prison was open. That's it, he said to himself. I've finally gone crazy. Now I'm seeing things. But the door remained open as he approached it. Richard walked on through, stopping to touch the open door and to verify that he had not lost his sanity. He passed two more lights before he came to a small open storage room on the right. Eight or nine manor melons were neatly stacked on the shelves. Aha, Richard thought. I get it. They've expanded my prison. From now on I'm allowed to obtain my own food. Now... If there's just a bathroom somewhere. Further down the hallway, there was indeed running water in another small room on the left. Richard drank heartily, washed his face, and was sorely tempted to bathe. However, his curiosity was too strong. He wanted to know the extent of his new domain. The corridor that ran just outside his cell ended at a perpendicular intersection. Richard could go either way. Thinking perhaps that he was in some kind of maze to test his mental capabilities, he dropped his outer shirt at the intersection and proceeded to the right. There were definitely more lights in that direction. After he had walked for twenty metres or so, he saw a pair of avians approaching in the distance. Actually, he heard their jabber first, for they were involved in an animated discussion. When they were only five metres away, Richard stopped. The two avians glanced at him, acknowledged him with a short shriek at a different pitch, and then continued on down the corridor. He next encountered a trio of avians with roughly the same interaction. What is going on here? Richard wondered as he continued to walk. Am I no longer in prison? In the first large room that he passed, four avians were sitting together in a circle, passing a set of polished sticks back and forth and jabbering constantly. Later, just before the hallway widened into a major meeting room, Richard stood in the doorway of another chamber and watched with fascination as a pair of leggies did what appeared to be push-ups on the top of a square table. 
Half a dozen quiet avians studied the leggies intently. There were twenty of the bird-like creatures in the meeting room. They were all gathered around a table, staring at a paper-like document that had been spread out in front of them. One of the avians had a pointer in its talon and was using it to indicate specific items on the document. There were strange squiggles on the paper that were totally incomprehensible, but Richard convinced himself that the avians were looking at a map. When Richard tried to move closer to the table so that he could see better, the avians in front of him graciously moved aside. Once in the ensuing conversation, Richard even thought from the body language around the table that one of the questions had been directed at him. I really am losing my mind, he told himself, shaking his head. But I still don't know why I have been given all this freedom, Richard thought, as he sat in his room and ate his manor melon. Six weeks had passed since he had found the door to his prison opened. Many changes had been made in his cell. Two of the lantern-like lights had been installed on his walls, and Richard was now sleeping on a pile of material that reminded him of hay. There was even a constantly filled container of fresh water in the corner of his room. Richard had felt certain, when his restrictions were initially lifted, that it was only a matter of hours or at most a day or two before something really significant happened. In a sense he had been correct, for the next morning two juvenile aliens had awakened him from his sleep and begun his avian language lessons. They had started with simple items, like the manor melon, water, and Richard himself, at which they would first point and then slowly repeat a sound, clearly the jabber word for that particular item. With some effort, Richard had learned a great deal of vocabulary, although his ability to differentiate between closely related shrieks and jabbers was not too sharp. He was absolutely hopeless when it came to making the sounds on his own. He simply didn't have the physical equipment to speak in the avian language. But Richard had expected that somehow his knowledge of the bigger picture would become clearer, and that had not happened. Certainly the avians were trying to educate him, and they had given him freedom to roam anywhere he wanted in their cylinder. He even ate with them occasionally, when he was in their midst and the manor melons showed up. But what was it all for? The way they looked at him, especially the leaders, suggested to Richard that they were expecting some kind of response. But what response, Richard asked himself for the hundredth time, as he finished his manor melon. As far as Richard could tell, the avians did not have a written language. He had seen no books, and none of the creatures ever wrote anything. There were those strange map-like documents that they occasionally studied, or at least that was Richard's interpretation of their activity, but they never created any of them, or marked on any of them. It was a puzzle. And what about the leggies? Richard encountered the creatures two or three times a week, and once had a pair in his room for several hours, but they would never sit still and let him analyse one of them. One time, when he had tried to grasp a leggy in his hand, Richard had received a rude shock, an electric current almost certainly, that had caused him to release the leggy immediately. Richard's mind jumped from image to image as he tried to ascertain some sensible pattern to his life in avian land. He was extremely frustrated. Yet he would not accept for a minute that there was no plan behind his capture, and then subsequent increased freedom. He continued to search for an answer by reviewing all his experiences in their domain. There was only one major area of the avian living quarters that was off-limits to Richard, and he probably could not have reached it anyway since he was unable to fly. Occasionally he would see one or two of the avians descend in the great vertical corridor and go below the levels that he normally frequented. Once Richard even saw a pair of hatchlings, no larger than a human hand, being carried up from the dark regions below. On another occasion, Richard had pointed down at the darkness, and his accompanying avian had shaken its head. Most of the creatures had learned the simple head motions of yes and no in Richard's language. But somewhere, Richard thought, there must be additional information. I must be missing some clues. He vowed to conduct an exhaustive survey of the entire avian living area, including not only the dense apartments on the opposite side of the vertical corridor, where he usually felt unwanted, but also the large manor melon storehouses on the bottom level. I will make a thorough map, he said to himself, to make certain that I haven't neglected something critical. As soon as Richard had rendered the avian living area in his three-dimensional graphics, he knew what he had been overlooking. The often disorganized passageways in the cylinder, including horizontal and vertical corridors for both walking and flight, had never been synthesized by Richard into one coherent picture. Of course, he said to himself as he projected different views of his complex map onto his computer monitor. 
How could I have been so stupid? More than seventy percent of the cylinder is still unaccounted for. Richard resolved to take his computer pictures to one of the avian leaders and request, somehow, to see the rest of the cylinder. It was not an easy task. Some kind of crisis was disturbing the avians that particular day, as the corridors were full of jabbers, shrieks, and avians rushing to and fro. Out in the great vertical corridor, Richard watched thirty or forty of the largest creatures fly up and out of the cylinder in some kind of organized formation. Finally, Richard managed to obtain the attention of one of the three ringed giants. It was fascinated by the detail it saw on the computer monitor and by all the different geometrical representations of its home. But Richard was unable to convey his primary message that he wanted to see the rest of the cylinder. The leader called in some colleagues to watch the demonstration, and Richard was treated to appreciative avian jabber. He was dismissed, however, when another bird broke into their meeting with what must have been important news about their ongoing crisis. Richard returned to his cell. He was dejected. He lay on his hay mat and thought of the family that he had left behind in New Eden. Maybe it's time for me to leave, he thought, wondering what the protocol was in avian land for obtaining permission to depart. While he was lying down, a visitor came into his room. Richard had never seen this particular avian before. It had four cobalt blue rings around its neck, and the velvet covering of its body was a deep black with occasional white tufts. Its eyes were astonishingly clear and, or so Richard surmised, very sad. The avian waited for Richard to stand, and then started speaking, very slowly. Richard understood some of the words, most importantly the oft-repeated combination, follow me. Outside his cell, three other avians were respectfully standing. They walked behind Richard and his important visitor. The group left Richard's cell area, crossed the single bridge that spanned the great vertical corridor, and entered the section of the cylinder where the manor melons were stored. At the back of one of the manor melon storehouses were indentations in the wall that Richard had not noticed when he had conducted his survey. When Richard and the avians approached within a few metres of the indentations, the wall slid to the side and revealed what appeared to be an enormous elevator. The avian super-leader gestured for him to enter. Once he was inside, the four avians each jabbered goodbye and formed into a circle to formalise their parting with a turn and a bow. Richard tried his best to imitate their jabber for goodbye before he also bowed and backed into the elevator. The wall closed seconds later. Chapter 4 The elevator ride was painfully slow. The immense car had a square floor approximately twenty metres on a side, with a ceiling that was another eight to ten metres above Richard's head. The floor of the car was flat everywhere, except for two pairs of parallel grooves, one pair on either side of Richard, that ran from the door to the back of the elevator. They can certainly transport huge loads in this, Richard thought, staring at the ceiling far above him. He tried to estimate the rate of descent of the elevator, but it was impossible. He had no frame of reference. According to Richard's map of the cylinder, the manor melon storehouses should have been about 1,100 metres above the base. So, if we're going all the way to the bottom, at what would be a normal elevator speed on Earth, then this trip may take several minutes. It was the longest three minutes of his life. Richard had absolutely no idea what he would find when the elevator doors opened. Maybe I'll be outside, he thought suddenly. Maybe I'll be on the edge of that region with the white structures. Could they be sending me home? He had just begun to wonder how life might have changed in New Eden when the elevator came to a stop. The large doors opened, and for several seconds Richard was certain that his heart had jumped out of his body. Standing directly in front of him, and obviously staring at him with all their eyes, were two creatures far stranger than any he had ever imagined. Richard could not move. What he was seeing was so unbelievable that he was physically paralysed, while his mind struggled with the bizarre inputs it was receiving from his senses. Each of the beings in front of him had four eyes on its head. In addition to the two large milky ovals on either side of an invisible line of symmetry that bisected the head, each creature had two additional eyes attached to stalks raised ten to twelve centimetres above the top of its forehead. Behind the large head, their bodies had three segments, with a pair of appendages for each segment, giving them six legs altogether. 
The aliens were standing upright on their two back legs, their front four appendages neatly tucked against their smooth, cream-coloured underbellies. They moved towards him in the elevator, and Richard backed away, frightened. The two creatures turned to each other and communicated in a high-frequency noise that originated from a small circular orifice below the oval eyes. Richard blinked, felt dizzy, and dropped down on one knee to steady himself. His heart was still pumping furiously. The aliens also changed position, putting their middle legs to the floor. In that posture they resembled giant ants with their front two legs off the ground and their heads raised high. The entire time the black spheres at the end of the eye stalks continued to pivot, scanning the full 360 degrees, and the milky material in the dark brown ovals moved from side to side. For several minutes they sat more or less stationary, as if they were encouraging Richard to examine them. Fighting against his fear, he tried to study them in an objective, scientific fashion. The creatures were roughly the size of medium-sized dogs, but they certainly weighed much less. Their bodies were thin and quite trim. The front and back segments were larger than the middle one, and all three body divisions displayed a polished carapace on top that was made of some kind of hard material. Richard would have classified them as very large insects, except for their extraordinary appendages, which were thick, perhaps even muscled, and covered with a short, very dense, black-and-white striped hair that made it appear as if the creatures were wearing pantyhose. Their hands, if that was the proper appellation, were free of the hairy covering and had four fingers each, including an opposing thumb on the front pair. Richard had just summoned enough courage to look again at their incredible heads when there was a high-pitched, siren-like noise behind the two aliens. They turned around. Richard stood up and saw a third creature approaching at a rapid clip. Its motion was marvellous to watch. It ran like a cat with six legs, stretching out parallel to the ground and pushing off with a different pair of legs at each point in its stride. The three engaged in a quick conversation, and the newcomer, lifting up its head and front legs, motioned unambiguously for Richard to leave the elevator. He walked out behind the trio and entered a very large chamber. This room was a manor melon storehouse also, but that was its only similarity to the one in the avian portion of the cylinder. High technology and automated equipment were everywhere. In the ceiling ten metres above them, a mechanical cherry picker was moving on a rail system. It would grasp individual melons and load them in freight cars on grooves at one end of the room. While Richard and his hosts watched, a freight car moved down the groove and came to a stop in the elevator. The creatures bounced off down one of the aisles in the room, and Richard hastened to follow. They waited for him at the door, then raced to their left, looking backward to see if he was still in sight. Richard ran after them for most of the next two minutes, until they reached a wide open atrium, many metres high, with a transportation device in its centre. The device was a remote cousin of the escalator. Actually, there were two of them, one going up and another down, that spiralled around the two thick poles in the centre of the atrium. The escalators moved very quickly, at quite a steep angle. Every five metres or so, they reached the next level, or floor, and the passengers then walked a metre to the spiral escalator around the other pole. What passed for a railing on the side of the escalator was a barrier only thirty centimetres high. The alien creatures rode in the horizontal position, with all six legs on the moving ramp. Richard, who was standing originally, quickly dropped down to all fours to keep from falling out. During the ride, a dozen or so other aliens, riding on the down half of the escalator, passed Richard and gawked at him with their amazing faces. But how do they eat? Richard wondered, noting that the circular hole they used for communication was certainly not large enough for much food. There were no other orifices on their heads, although there were some small knobs and wrinkles whose purposes were unknown. Where they were taking Richard was on the eighth or ninth level. All three of the creatures waited for him until he reached the appointed platform. Richard followed them into a hexagonal building with bright red markings on the front. That's funny, Richard thought, staring at the strange squiggles. I've seen that writing before. Of course. On the map or whatever document it was the avians were reading. Richard was placed in a room that was well lit and tastefully decorated in black and white with geometric patterns. There were objects around him of all shapes and sizes, but Richard had no idea what any of them were. 
The aliens used sign language to inform Richard that this was where he was going to stay. Then they departed. A weary Richard studied the furniture, trying to figure out which thing might be the bed, and then stretched out on the floor to sleep. Mermicats, that's what I'll call them. Richard had awakened after sleeping for four hours and could not stop thinking about the alien creatures. He wanted to give them a good name. After dismissing both Cat Ant and Cat Sect, he remembered that someone who studies ants is called a myrmecologist. He chose Myrmecat because it looked better in his mind when spelled with an I instead of an E. Richard's room was well lit. In fact, every place he had been in the Myrmecat habitat had had good illumination, which was in marked contrast to the dark, catacomb-like corridors of the upper portions of the brown cylinder. I have not seen any of the avians since the elevator ride, Richard was thinking. So, apparently, these two species do not live together. At least not completely. But they both use manor melons. What exactly is their connection? A pair of myrmicats bounded through the entry, placed a neatly sectioned melon and a cup of water in front of him, and then disappeared. Richard was both hungry and thirsty. Several seconds after he had finished with his breakfast, the pair of creatures returned. Using their hands on their front legs, the myrmicats gestured for him to stand up. Richard stared at them. Are these the same creatures as yesterday? he wondered. And are they the same pair that brought the melon and the water? He thought back over all the myrmicats he had seen, including those who had passed him going down the escalator. He could not recall a single distinguishing or identifying characteristic in any individual. So, they all look the same? he thought. Then how do they tell each other apart? The myrmicats led him out into the corridor and bolted away to the right. This is great, Richard said to himself, starting to jog after spending a few seconds admiring the beauty of their gait. They must think humans are all athletes. One of the myrmicats stopped about forty metres in front of him. It did not turn around, but Richard could tell it was watching him because both of its stalk eyes were bent back in his direction. I'm coming, Richard shouted, but I can't run that fast. It wasn't long before Richard figured out that the pair of aliens was giving him a guided tour of the Myrmicat domain. The tour was very logically planned. The first stop, a very brief one, was at a Manor Melon storehouse. Richard watched two freight cars filled with melons slide down grooves into an elevator similar to, or identical with, the one in which he had descended the day before. After another five-minute jog, Richard entered an entirely different section of the Myrmicat den. Whereas the walls in the other section had been mostly metallic grey or white, except in his room, here the rooms and corridors were all decorated profusely, either with colours or geometric patterns, or both. One vast chamber was about the size of a theatre, and had three liquid pools in its floor. About a hundred myrmicats were in this room, half apparently swimming in the pools, with only their stalk eyes and the top half of their carapaces above the waterline and the other half either sitting on the ridges dividing the three pools from each other, or milling around in a weird building on the far side of the room. But were they actually swimming? On closer inspection, Richard noticed that the creatures did not move around in the pool. They just submerged in a given spot and stayed under the water for several minutes. Two of the pools were quite thick, roughly the consistency of a rich creamy soup on earth, and the third clear pool was almost certainly water. Richard followed a single myrmicat as it moved from one of the thick pools to the water, then over to the other thick pool. What are they doing? Richard wondered. And why have they brought me here? As if on cue, he was tapped on the back by one of the myrmicats. It pointed to Richard, then to the pools, and then to Richard's mouth. He had no idea what it was telling him. The guide myrmicat next walked down the slope toward the pools and submerged itself in one of the thicker pools. When it returned, it stood on its back pair of legs and pointed to the grooves between the segments of its soft, cream-coloured underbelly. It was clearly important to the myrmicats that Richard understand what was going on at the pools. At the next stop, he watched a combination of myrmicats and some high-technology machines grinding up fibrous material and then mixing it with water and other liquids to create a thin slurry that looked like what was in one of the pools. At length, one of the aliens put its finger into the slurry and then touched the material to Richard's lips. They must be telling me that the pools are for feeding, Richard thought. 
So they don't eat manna melon after all. Or at least they have a more varied diet. This is all fascinating. Soon they were off on another jog to another distant corner of the den. Here Richard saw thirty or forty smaller creatures, obviously juvenile myrmicats, engaged in activities with supervisory adults. In physical appearance the little ones resembled their elders, except for one major difference. They had no carapace. Richard concluded that the hard top covering was probably not exuded by the creature until its growth was complete, although Richard imagined that what he saw occurring with the juveniles was a rough approximation of school, or perhaps a nursery. He, of course, had no way of knowing for certain. But at one point he was sure that he heard the juveniles repeating in unison a sequence of sounds made by an adult myrmicat. Richard next rode the escalator with his pair of tour guides. On about the twentieth level the creatures left the escalator and the open atrium, racing quickly down a corridor that ended in a vast factory filled with myrmicats and machines engaged in an impressive array of tasks. His guides always seemed to be in a hurry, so it was difficult to Richard to study any particular process. The factory was like a machine shop on earth. There were noises of all kinds, smells of chemicals and metals, and the whine of myrmicat communication throughout the room. At one position, Richard watched a pair of myrmicats repair a cherry picker similar to the machine that he had seen operating in the Manor Melon storehouse the day before. In one corner of the factory was a special area that was sealed off from the rest of the work. Although his guides did not lead him in that direction, Richard's curiosity was piqued. Nobody stopped him when he crossed the threshold of the special area. Inside the large cubicle, a myrmicat operator was presiding over an automated manufacturing process. Long, skinny, jointed pieces of light metal or plastic came into the room on a conveyor belt from one direction. Small spheres about two centimetres in diameter entered from an adjacent cubicle on another conveyor. Where the two belts merged, a large, rectangular machine, mounted in housing that was hanging from the high ceiling, descended onto the parts with a peculiar sucking sound. Thirty seconds later, the myrmicat operator caused the machine to withdraw, and a pair of leggies scrambled off the belt, folded their long legs around them, and jumped into positions in a box that looked like a gigantic egg carton. Richard watched the process repeat several times. He was fascinated. He was also slightly bewildered. So the myrmicats make the leggies, and the maps, and probably the spacecraft too wherever they and the avians come from. So what is this? Some advanced kind of symbiosis? He shook his head as the leggy assembly process in front of him continued. Moments later, Richard heard a myrmicat noise behind him. He turned around. One of his guides extended a slice of manna melon in his direction. Richard was becoming exhausted. He had no idea how long he had been touring, but he felt as if it had been many, many hours. There was no way he could possibly synthesize everything he had seen. After the ride in the small elevator to the upper reaches of the Myrmicat region, where Richard not only had visited the avian hospital staffed and run by the Myrmicats, but also had watched the avians hatching out of brown, leathery eggs under the watchful eyes of Myrmicat doctors, Richard knew for certain that there was indeed a complex symbiotic relationship between the two species. But why, he wondered, as his guides allowed him to rest temporarily near the top of the escalator. The avians clearly benefit from the myrmicats, but what do these giant ant cats get from the avians? His guides led him down a broad corridor toward a large door several hundred meters in the distance. For once they were not running. As they neared the door, three other myrmicats entered the hallway from similar side corridors, and the creatures began to talk in their high-frequency language. At one point, all five of them stopped, and Richard imagined that an argument was underway. He studied them carefully while they talked, especially their faces. Even the wrinkles and folds around the noise-making orifice and oval eyes were identical from creature to creature. There was absolutely no way of distinguishing one myrmicat from another. At length the entire group began again to walk toward the door. From the distance Richard had underestimated its size. As he drew near, he could see that it was twelve to fifteen metres tall, and more than three metres wide. Its surface was intricately and magnificently carved, the central focus of the artwork being a square, four-panel decoration with a flying avian in the upper left quadrant, a manor melon in the upper right, 
a running myrmecat in the lower left partition, and something that looked like candy floss with scattered, thick, clustered lumps in the lower right. Richard stopped to admire the artwork. At first he had a vague feeling that he had seen this door, or at least the design, before, but he told himself that it couldn't be possible. However, as he was running his fingers across the sculpted figure of the myrmecat, his memory suddenly awoke. Yes, yes, Richard thought excitedly to himself, of course. At the back of the avian lair in Rama too, that was where the fire was. Moments later, the door swung open, and Richard was ushered into what resembled a large underground cathedral. The room in which he found himself was over fifty metres tall. Its basic floor shape was a circle, about thirty metres in diameter, and there were six separate naves off to the side, around the circle. The walls were dazzling. Virtually every square inch contained sculptures or supporting frescoes, meticulously created with great attention to detail. It was overwhelmingly beautiful. At the centre of the cathedral was an elevated platform on which a myrmecat was standing and speaking. Below him were a dozen others, all sitting on their back four legs and watching the speaker with rapt attention. As Richard wandered around in the room, he realised that the decorations on the wall, in a metre-wide strip about eighty centimetres above the floor, were telling an orderly story. Richard quietly followed the artwork until he reached what he thought was the beginning of the story. The first decoration was a sculptured portrait of a manor melon. In the next three panels, something could be seen growing inside the melon. Whatever was growing was tiny in the second panel, but by the fourth sculpture, it occupied almost the entire interior of the melon. In the fifth panel, a tiny head with two milky oval eyes, stalk nubs, and a small circular orifice below the eyes could be seen poking its way out of the melon. The sixth sculpture, which showed a juvenile myrmecat very much like the ones Richard had seen earlier in the day, confirmed what he had been surmising as he had been following the decorations. Holy shit, Richard said to himself. So a manor melon is a myrmecat egg. His thoughts raced ahead. But that doesn't make sense. The avians eat the melons. In fact, the myrmecats even feed them to me. What's going on here? Richard was so astonished by what he had discovered, and so tired from all the running during the tour, that he sat down in front of the sculpture containing the juvenile myrmecats. He tried to figure out the relationship between the myrmecats and the avians. He could cite no parallel symbiosis on Earth, although he was well aware that species often work together to improve each other's chances for survival. But how could one species remain friendly with another when its eggs were the sole food for the second species? Richard concluded that what he had thought were fundamental biological tenets did not apply to the avians and the myrmecats. While Richard was pondering the strange new things he had learned, a group of myrmecats gathered around him. They all motioned for him to stand up. A minute later he was following them down a winding ramp on the other side of the room to a special crypt in the basement of their cathedral. For the first time since Richard had entered the habitat, the lighting was dim. The myrmecats beside him moved slowly, almost reverently, as they proceeded down a broad passage with an arched ceiling. At the other end of the passage was a pair of doors that opened into a large room filled with a soft white material. Although the material, which looked like cotton from a distance, was densely arrayed, its individual filaments were mostly very thin, except where they came in clumps, or ganglia, that were scattered in no definable pattern throughout the large white volume. Richard and the myrmecats stopped in the entryway a metre or so away from where the material began. The cottony network extended in all directions for as far as Richard could see. While he was studying its intricate mesh construction, the elements of the material very slowly began to move, pulling apart to form a lane that would continue the path from the passage into the interior of its network. It's alive, Richard thought, his pulse racing as he watched in fascination and terror. Five minutes later, an alley had opened up that was just large enough for Richard to walk ten metres into the material. The myrmecats around him were all pointing toward the cottony web. Richard started shaking his head. I'm sorry, fellas, Richard wanted to say, but there's something about this situation that I don't like. So I'll just skip this part of the tour if it's all right with you. The myrmecats kept pointing. Richard had no choice, and he knew it. "'What's it going to do to me?' he asked, as he took his first step forward. "'Eat me?' 
Is that what this has been all about? That would make no sense at all. He turned around. The Myrmicats had not moved. Richard took a deep breath and walked the full ten metres into the lane, to a spot where he could reach out and touch one of the odd ganglia in the living mesh. As he was examining the ganglion carefully, the material around him began to move again. Richard whirled around and saw that the lane behind him was closing. Momentarily frantic, he tried to run in that direction, back toward the passage, but it was a waste of energy. The net caught him, and he resigned himself to accept whatever was going to happen next. Richard stood perfectly still as the web enveloped him. The tiny elements, like threads, were about a millimetre wide. Slowly, steadily, they began to cover his body. Wait, Richard thought, wait, you're going to suffocate me. But surprisingly, even though hundreds of filaments were already wrapping around his head and face, he was having no difficulty breathing. Before his hands were immobilized, Richard tried to pull one of the tiny elements off his arm. It was almost impossible. As they had been wrapping around him, the threads had also been making insertions into his skin. After many tugs, he finally succeeded in freeing the white filaments from one small portion of his forearm, but he was bleeding in the areas that had been freed. Richard surveyed his body and estimated that he probably had a million or so pieces of the living mesh underneath the outer layer of his skin. He shuddered. Richard was still amazed that he had not suffocated. As his mind began to wonder how air was getting to him through the web, he heard another voice inside his head. Stop trying to analyse everything, it said. You'll never understand it, anyway. For once in your life, just experience the incredible adventure. Chapter 5 Again Richard had lost track of time. Sometime during the days, or had it been weeks, that he had been living inside the alien net, he had changed positions. During one of his early naps, the web had also removed his clothes. Richard was now lying on his back, supported by an extremely dense section of the fine mesh network enveloping his body. His mind no longer actively wondered how he was managing to survive. Somehow, whenever he felt hunger or thirst, his needs were swiftly satisfied. His wastes always disappeared within minutes. Breathing was easy even though he was completely surrounded by the living web. Richard passed many of his conscious hours studying the creature around him. If he looked carefully, he could see the tiny elements constantly in motion. The patterns in the net around him altered very slowly, but they definitely did change. Richard mentally plotted the trajectories of the ganglia that he could see. At one point, three separate ganglia migrated into his vicinity and formed a triangle in front of his head. The net developed a regular cycle of interacting with Richard. It would keep its millions of filaments attached to him for fifteen to twenty hours at a time, and then release him completely for several hours. Richard slept without dreaming whenever he was not attached to the web. If he happened to awaken, still in the unattached mode, he was enervated and listless. But each time the threads began to wind around him again, he felt a renewed surge of energy. His dreams were active and vivid if he slept while attached to the alien net. Richard had never dreamed much before, and had often laughed at Nicole's preoccupation with her dreams. But as his sleeping images became more complex, and in some cases quite bizarre, Richard began to appreciate why Nicole paid so much attention to them. One night he dreamed that he was again a teenager, and was watching a theatrical performance of As You Like It in his hometown of Stratford-upon-Avon. The lovely blonde girl who was playing Rosalind came down from the stage and whispered in his ear, "'Are you Richard Wakefield?' she asked in the dream. Yes, he answered. The actress began to kiss Richard, first slowly, then more passionately, with a lively tickling tongue darting around inside his mouth. He felt a surge of overpowering desire, and then woke up abruptly, strangely embarrassed by both his nakedness and his erection. Now, what was that all about? Richard wondered, echoing the phrase he had often heard from Nicole. At some stage in his captivity, his recollections of Nicole became much sharper, more clearly delineated. Richard found to his surprise that in the absence of other stimuli, he was able, if he concentrated, to recall entire conversations with Nicole, including such details as the kind of facial expressions she used to punctuate her sentences. In the protracted solitude of his long period inside the web, Richard often ached with loneliness, the vivid memories making him miss his beloved wife even more.
His memories of the children were equally sharp. He missed them all as well, especially Katie. He remembered his last conversation with his special daughter, several days before the wedding, when she had come by the house to pick up some of her clothes. Katie had been depressed and needed support, but Richard had been unable to help her. The connection just wasn't there, Richard thought. The recent image of Katie as a sexy young woman was replaced by a picture of a reckless ten-year-old girl scampering across the plazas of New York. The juxtaposition of the two images provoked a profound feeling of loss in Richard. I was never comfortable with Katie after she awakened, he realized with a sigh. I still wanted my little girl. The clarity of his recollections of Nicole and Katie convinced Richard that something extraordinary was happening to his memory. He discovered that he could also recall the exact scores of every World Cup quarter-final, semi-final, and final between 2174 and 2190. Richard had known all that useless information as a young man, for he had been an avid soccer fan. However, during the years before the launch of the Newton, when so many new things had crowded into his brain, he had often been unable, even during soccer discussions with his friends, to recall even the participants in a key World Cup match. As the visual images from his memories continued to sharpen, Richard found that he was also recalling the emotions that had been associated with the pictures. It was almost as if he were completely reliving the experiences. In one long recollection, he remembered not only the overpowering feelings of love and adoration that he had felt for Sarah Tidings when he had first seen her perform on stage, but also the thrill and excitement of their courtship, including the unbridled passion of their first night of love. It had left him breathless then, and now, many years later, enveloped by an alien creature resembling a neural net, Richard's response was equally powerful. Soon it seemed as if Richard no longer had any control over which memories were activated in his brain. In the beginning, or so he believed, he had purposely thought about Nicole, or his children, or even his courtship with the young Sarah Tidings, just to make himself happy. Now, he said one day in an imaginary conversation with the Cecil Net, after refreshing my memory, for God knows what purpose, it seems that you are reading it all out. For many hours Richard enjoyed the forced memory readout, especially those portions covering his life at Cambridge and the Space Academy, when his days were enlivened by the constant joy of new knowledge. Quantum physics, the Cambrian explosion, probability and statistics, even the long-forgotten vocabulary words from his German lessons reminded him how much of his happiness in life had been due to the excitement of learning. In another particularly satisfying remembrance, his mind jumped swiftly from play to play, covering every live performance of Shakespeare that he had seen between the ages of ten and seventeen. Everyone needs a hero, Richard thought, after the montage of scenes, as impetus to bring out the best in himself. My hero was definitely William Shakespeare. Some of the memories were painful, especially those from his childhood. In one of them Richard was eight years old again, sitting on a bench at the small table in his family's dining room. The atmosphere at the table was tense. His father, drunk and angry at the world, was glowering at all of them as they ate their dinner in silence. Richard accidentally spilt some of his soup, and seconds later the back of his father's hand hit him hard on the cheek, knocking him off his bench and into the corner of the room, where he trembled from fear and shock. He had not thought about that moment for years. Richard was unable to restrain his tears as he recalled how helpless and scared he had been around his neurotic, abusive father. One day Richard suddenly began to remember details from his long odyssey in Rama II, and a powerful headache almost blinded him. He saw himself in a strange room, lying on a floor surrounded by three or four octo-spiders. Dozens of probes and other instruments had been implanted in him, and some kind of test was underway. Stop! Stop! Richard shouted, destroying the memory picture with his acute agitation. My head is killing me! Miraculously, his headache began to fade, and Richard was again among the octo-spiders in his memory. He recalled the days and days of testing that he had experienced, and the tiny living creatures that had been inserted into his body. He recalled also a peculiar set of sexual experiments, in which he had been subjected to all kinds of external stimulation, and rewarded when he ejaculated. Richard was startled by these new memories that he had never accessed before, never once since he had awakened from the coma in which his family had found him in New York. Now I remember other things about the octo-spiders, too, he thought excitedly. They talked to each other in colours that wrapped around their heads. They were basically friendly, but determined to learn everything they could about me. They 
The mental picture vanished and Richard's headache returned. The threads from the net had just disconnected. Richard was exhausted and quickly fell asleep. After days and days of one memory after another, the readout abruptly ceased. Richard's mind was no longer driven by an external forcing function. The threads of the net remained unattached for long periods of time. A week passed without incident. In the second week, however, an unusual spherical ganglion, far larger and more densely wrapped than the normal clumps in the living web, began to develop about twenty centimetres away from Richard's head. The ganglion grew until it was about the size of a basketball. Soon thereafter, the immense clump issued hundreds of filaments that inserted themselves into the skin around the circumference of Richard's skull. At last, Richard thought, ignoring the pain caused by the invasion of the threads into his brain, now we will see what this has all been about. He began immediately to see some kind of pictures, although they were so fuzzy that he could not identify anything specific. The quality of Richard's mental images improved very quickly, however, for he cleverly devised a rudimentary way of communicating with the web. As soon as the first image appeared in his mind, Richard concluded that the net, which had been reading his memory output for days, was now trying to write into his brain. But the web obviously had no way of measuring the quality of the images that Richard was receiving. Remembering his trips to the eye doctor as a boy, and the communication pattern that resulted in the final specifications for his eyeglass lenses, Richard pointed his thumb up or down to indicate whether each change the net made in its transmission process made the picture better or worse. In that manner, Richard was soon able to see what the alien was attempting to show him. The first pictures were images of a planet taken from a spacecraft. The cloud-covered world, with two smallish moons and a distant, solitary yellow star as its heat and light source, was almost certainly the home planet of the sessile webs. The suite of pictures that followed showed Richard various landscapes from the planet. Fog was ubiquitous on the home world of the sessiles. Below the fog, in most of the images, was a brown, rockless, barren surface. Only in the littorals, where the barren ground encountered the waves of the green liquid lakes and oceans, was there any suggestion of life. In one of these oases, Richard saw not only several avians, but also a fascinating melange of other living things. Richard could have spent days examining just one or two of these pictures, but he was not in control of the image sequence. The net had some purpose for its communication, he was certain, and the first set of pictures was only an introduction. All of the remaining images featured either an avian, a manor melon, a myrmicat, a sessile web, or some combination of the quartet. The scenes were all taken from what Richard assumed was normal life on their home planet, and expanded on the general theme of symbiosis among the species. In several pictures, the aliens were shown defending the subterranean colonies of the myrmicats and sessiles from invasions by what appeared to be small animals and plants. Other images depicted the myrmicats ministering to avian hatchlings or transporting large quantities of manor melons to an avian mound. Richard was puzzled when he saw several pictures that showed tiny manor melons embedded inside the sessile creatures. Why would the myrmicats lay their eggs in here, he wondered? For protection? Or are these weird webs a kind of thinking placenta? One definite impression left upon Richard by the sequence of images was that the sessiles were, in a hierarchical sense, the dominant species of the three. The pictures all suggested that both the myrmicats and the avians paid homage to the web creatures. Do these nets, then, somehow do all the important thinking for the avians and myrmicats? Richard asked himself. What incredible symbiotic relationships! How in the world could they possibly have evolved? There were several thousand frames altogether in the sequence. After it repeated twice, the filaments detached themselves from Richard and returned to the giant ganglion. In the days that followed, Richard was essentially left alone, the attachments to his host being limited to those necessary for him to survive. When a lane formed in the web, and Richard could see the door through which he had entered many weeks before, he thought that he was going to be released. His momentary excitement, however, was quickly dampened. At his first attempt to move, the sessile net tightened its grip on all parts of his body. So what is the purpose of the lane? As Richard watched, a trio of myrmicats entered from the hallway. The creature in the middle had two broken legs, and its back segment was crushed, as if it had been run over by a heavy car or truck.
Its two companions carried the disabled mermaid cat into the web and then departed. Within seconds, the sessile began to wrap itself around the new arrival. Richard was about two meters away from the crippled mermaid cat. The region between him and the injured creature emptied of all filaments and clumps. Richard had never before seen such a gap inside the sessile. So, my education continues, he mused. What is it that I am supposed to learn now? That sessiles are doctors to the myrmicats, just as the myrmicats are doctors to the avians? The web did not limit its attention to the injured portions of the myrmicat. In fact, during one long waking period, Richard watched the net completely enclose the creature in a tight cocoon. At the same time, the large ganglion in Richard's immediate vicinity migrated over to the cocoon. Later, after a nap, Richard noticed that the ganglion had returned to his side. The cocoon across the gap had almost finished unravelling. Richard's pulse rate doubled as the cocoon completely disappeared, and there was no trace of the myrmicat. Richard didn't have much time to wonder what had happened to the myrmicat. Within minutes, the filaments from the large ganglion were again attached to his skull, and another picture show was playing inside his brain. In the very first image, Richard saw five human soldiers camping on the shore of the moat inside the avian habitat. They were eating a meal. Beside them were an impressive array of weapons, including two machine guns. The pictures that followed showed humans on the attack throughout the second habitat. Two of the early scenes were especially gruesome. In the first, a juvenile avian had been decapitated in mid-air and was falling to the ground. A pair of satisfied humans congratulated each other in the lower left portion of the same frame. The second image depicted a large square hole in one of the grassland sectors of the green region. Inside the hole could be seen the remains of several dead avians. A human with a wheelbarrow containing another pair of avian corpses was approaching the mass grave from the left. Richard was staggered by what he was seeing. What are these pictures, anyway? he wondered. And why am I seeing them now? He quickly reviewed all the recent events in his sessile world and concluded, with considerable shock, that the disabled myrmicat must have actually seen everything Richard was being shown, and that the web creature had somehow removed the images from the mind of the myrmicat and transferred them into Richard's brain. Once he understood what he was seeing, Richard paid more attention to the pictures themselves. He was completely outraged by the invasion and slaughter that he saw. In one of the later images, three human soldiers were shown raiding an avian apartment complex inside the brown cylinder. There were no survivors. These poor creatures are doomed, Richard said to himself, and they must know it. Tears suddenly formed in Richard's eyes, and a profound sadness, deeper than any he had ever known, accompanied his realization that members of his own species were systematically exterminating the avians. No, no, he shouted silently. Stop. Oh, please stop. Can't you see what you are doing? These avians, too, proclaim the miracle of chemicals raised to consciousness. They are like us. They are our brothers. In the next several seconds, Richard's many interactions with the bird-like creatures flooded his memory and chased away the implanted images. They saved my life, he thought, his mind focusing on the flight long ago, across the cylindrical sea, with absolutely no benefit to themselves. What human, he said to himself bitterly, would have done such a good deed for an avian. Richard had rarely sobbed in his life, but his sorrow for the avians overpowered him. As he wept, all his experiences since entering the avian habitat filed through his mind. Richard recalled especially the sudden change in their treatment of him and his subsequent transfer to the realm of the Myrmicats. Then came the guided tour and my eventual placement here, it's obvious they have been trying to communicate with me. But why? At that instant, Richard had an epiphany of such power that tears rushed into his eyes again. Because they are desperate, he answered himself. They are begging me to help. Chapter 6 Again a large void was created in the interior of the sessile. Richard watched carefully as thirty small ganglia formed into a sphere with a diameter of about fifty centimetres on the other side of the gap. An unusually thick filament connected each of the ganglia with the centre of the sphere. At first, Richard could detect nothing inside the sphere. After the ganglia had moved to another location, however, he saw, where the sphere had been, a tiny green object with hundreds of infinitesimal threads anchoring it to the rest of the web. It grew very slowly. 
The ganglia had already finished migrating to three new positions, repeating the same spherical configuration each time, before Richard recognized that what was growing in the sessile was a manor melon. He was thunderstruck. Richard could not imagine how the vanished myrmicat could possibly have left behind eggs that had taken so long to germinate. And they must have been only a few cells then. Tiny, tiny embryos, somehow nurtured here. His own thoughts were interrupted by his realization that these new manor melons were developing in a region of the sessile that was almost twenty meters away from where the myrmicat had been cocooned. So this web creature transported the eggs from one place to another, and then retained them for weeks. Richard's logical mind began to reject the hypothesis that the vanished myrmicat had laid any eggs at all. Slowly but surely, he developed an alternative explanation for what he had observed that suggested a biology more complex than any he had ever encountered on Earth. What if, he asked himself, the manor melons, myrmicats, and this sessile web were all manifestations of what we would call the same species? Staggered by the ramifications of this simple thought, Richard spent two long waking periods reviewing everything he had seen inside the second habitat. As he stared at the four manor melons growing across the gap from him, Richard envisioned a cycle of metamorphosis in which the manor melons gave birth to the myrmicats, who in turn came to die and add new matter to the sessile net, which then laid the manor melon eggs that began the process again. There was nothing he had observed that was inconsistent with this explanation, but Richard's brain was exploding with thousands of questions, not only about how this intricate set of metamorphoses took place, but also about why this species had evolved into such a complex being in the first place. Most of Richard's academic study had been in fields that he had always proudly called hard science. Mathematics and physics had been the primary elements of his education. As he struggled to understand the possible life cycles of the creature in which he had been living for many weeks, Richard was bewildered by his ignorance. He wished that he had learned much more about biology. For how can I help them? he asked himself. I have no idea even where to start. Much later, Richard would wonder if by this time in his stay inside the sessile, the creature had learned not only how to read his memory, but also how to interpret his thoughts. His visitors arrived a few days afterwards. Again, a lane formed in the sessile between Richard's position and the original entryway. Four identical myrmicats walked down the lane and gestured for Richard to join them. They were carrying his clothes. When Richard made an effort to move, his alien host did not try to restrain him. His legs were wobbly, but after dressing, Richard managed to follow the myrmicats back into the corridor deep within the brown cylinder. The large chamber had obviously been recently modified. The vast mural on its walls was not yet completed. In fact, at the same time that Richard's Myrmicat teacher was pointing to specific items in the painting that had already been finished, Myrmicat artists were still at work on the remainder of the mural. During Richard's early lessons in the room, as many as a dozen of the creatures were engaged in sketching or painting the other sections. Only one visit to the mural chamber was necessary for Richard to ascertain its purpose. The entire room was being created to give him information on how he could help the alien species survive. It was clear these extraterrestrials knew that they were about to be overrun and destroyed by the humans. The paintings in this room were their attempt to provide Richard with the data he might need to save them. But could he learn enough simply from the pictures? The artwork was brilliant. From time to time Richard would suspend the activity in his left brain that was trying to interpret the messages in the paintings so that his right brain could appreciate the talent of the Myrmicat artists. The creatures worked in the upright position, their back two legs on the floor and their four front legs operating together to implement the sketch or painting. They talked among themselves, apparently asking questions, but did not make so much noise that Richard was disturbed across the chamber. The entire first half of the mural was a textbook in alien biology. It proved that Richard's fundamental understanding of the strange creature was correct. There were over a hundred individual paintings in the main sequence, of which two dozen showed different stages in the development of the Myrmicat embryo, expanding considerably the knowledge that Richard had gleaned from the sculptures inside the Myrmicat Cathedral. The primary panels explaining the embryological progression followed a straight line around the walls of the chamber. Above and below these main sequence pictures were supporting or supplementary frames, most of which were beyond Richard's comprehension. For example, 
a quartet of supporting paintings had been arranged around a picture of a man melon that had recently been removed from a sessile web, but had not yet begun any myrmicat development activity in its interior. Richard was certain that these four additional pictures were trying to give him specific information about the ambient conditions required for the germination process to begin. However, the Myrmicat artists had used scenes from their home planet, illustrating the desired conditions with landscapes of fogs and lakes and their native flora and fauna to communicate the data. Richard just shook his head when the Myrmicat teacher pointed at these paintings. A diagram across the top of the main sequence used suns and moons to specify time scales. Richard understood from the arrangement that the lifetime of the Myrmicat manifestation of the species was very short when compared with the lifetime of the sessiles. He was unable, however, to figure out anything else the diagram was trying to convey. Richard was also somewhat confused about the numerical relationships among the different manifestations of the species. It was clear that each melon resulted in a single myrmicat. There were no examples of twins shown. And that a sessile could produce many melons. But what was the ratio of sessiles to myrmicats? In one frame, a large sessile was presented with a dozen different myrmicats in its interior, each in a different phase of cocooning. What was that supposed to indicate? Richard slept in a small room not far from the mural chamber. His lessons lasted three to four hours each, after which he would be fed or allowed to sleep. Sometimes, when he entered the chamber, Richard would glance over at the paintings, some still incomplete, in the second half of the mural. If that happened, the lights in the chamber would immediately be extinguished. The Myrmicats wanted to be certain that Richard learned his biology first. After about ten days, the second half of the mural was finished. Richard was stunned when he was finally allowed to see it. The renderings of the many human beings and avians were exceptionally accurate. Richard himself appeared half a dozen times in the paintings. With his long hair and beard, both of them more than half white, he almost didn't recognize himself. I could pass for Christ in these pictures he joked as he wandered around the chamber. Part of the remaining mural was a historical summary of the invasion of the alien habitat by the humans. There was more detail than Richard had seen in his mental picture show while he was inside the sessile, but he did not learn anything substantively new. He was, however, again disturbed emotionally by the horrible details of the continuing massacre. The pictures also triggered an interesting question in his mind. Why had the contents of this mural not been transferred directly to him by the sessile, thereby obviating the entire effort by the Myrmicat artists? Perhaps, Richard mused, the sessile is a recording device only, and is incapable of imagination. Maybe it can only show me what has already been seen by one of the Myrmicats. What was left of the mural explicitly defined what the Myrmicat sessile creatures were asking Richard to do. What was left of the mural explicitly defined what the Myrmicat sessile creatures were asking Richard to do. In each of his portraits, he was wearing a large blue pack over his shoulders. The pack had two large pockets in the front, and two more in the back, each containing a melon. There were two additional smaller pockets on the sides of the pack. One was stuffed with a silver cylindrical tube about fifteen centimetres long, and the other contained two small leathery avian eggs. The mural showed Richard's suggested activity in an orderly sequence. He would leave the brown cylinder through an exit below the ground level and come out in the green region on the other side of both the ring of white buildings and the thin canal. There, guided by a pair of avians, he would descend to the shore of the moat where he would be picked up by a small submarine. The submarine would dive under the module wall, enter a large body of water and then surface on the shore of an island with many skyscrapers. Richard smiled as he studied the mural. So, both the cylindrical sea and New York are still here, he thought. He remembered what the eagle had said about not making unnecessary changes to Rama. That means our lair may be there as well. There were many additional pictures surrounding Richard's escape sequence, some giving more details about the alien plants and animals in the green region, and others providing explicit instructions on how to operate the submarine. When Richard tried to copy what he thought was the most important of this information into his portable computer from the Newton, the Myrmicat teacher suddenly seemed impatient. Richard wondered if the crisis situation had worsened. The next day, after a long nap, Richard was outfitted with his pack and ushered into the sessile chamber by his hosts. There the four melons he had watched growing two weeks previously 
were removed from the web by the Myrmicats and placed in his pack. They were quite heavy. Richard estimated that they weighed twenty kilograms altogether. Another Myrmicat then used an instrument similar to a large scissors to remove from the sessile a cylindrical volume containing four ganglia and their associated filaments. This sessile material was placed in a silver tube and inserted in one of Richard's smaller side pockets. The avian eggs were the last elements to be loaded. Richard took a deep breath. This must be goodbye, he thought as the Myrmicats pointed down the corridor. For some reason, he remembered Nai Watanabe's insistence that the Thai greeting called the Wai, a small bow with hands clasped together in front of the upper chest, was a universal sign of respect. Smiling to himself, Richard performed a Wai to the half-dozen Myrmicats surrounding him. To his astonishment, each of them placed its four forward legs together in pairs in front of its underbelly and made a slight bow in his direction. The deep basement of the brown cylinder was obviously uninhabited. After leaving the sessile chamber, Richard and his guide had first passed many other myrmicats, especially in the vicinity of the atrium. But once they had entered the ramp that descended to the basement, they had never encountered even a single myrmicat. Richard's guide dispatched a leggy in front of them. It raced along the final narrow tunnel and through the vault-like emergency exit into the green region. When the leggy returned, it stood on the back of the Myrmicat's head for several seconds and then scampered down to the floor. The guide motioned for Richard to proceed into the tunnel. Outside, in the green region, Richard was met by two large avians who immediately became airborne. One of them had an ugly scar on its wing, as if it had been hit by a spray of bullets. Richard was in a moderately dense forest, with growth around him up to three or four metres off the ground. Even though the light was dim, it was not difficult for Richard to find a pathway or to follow the avians above him. Occasionally, he heard sporadic gunfire off in the distance. The first fifteen minutes passed without incident. The forest thickness lessened. Richard had just estimated that he should be at the moat for the rendezvous with the submarine in another ten minutes when, without any warning, a machine gun began to fire no more than a hundred meters away. One of the guide avians crashed to the ground. The other avian disappeared. Richard hid himself in a dark thicket when he heard the soldiers coming in his direction. Two rings for certain, one of them said. Maybe even three. That would give me twenty rings this week alone. Shit, man, that was no contest. It shouldn't even count. The damn bird didn't even know you were there. That's his problem, not mine. I still get to count his rings. Ah, oh, here he is. Crap. He only has two. The men were only about fifteen metres away from Richard. He stood absolutely still, not daring to move, for more than five minutes. The soldiers, meanwhile, stayed in the vicinity of the avian corpse, smoking and talking about the war. Richard began to feel pain in his right foot. He shifted his weight ever so slightly, thinking he would relieve whatever muscle was being strained, but the pain only increased. At length he glanced down and discovered to his horror that one of the rodent-like creatures he had seen in the mural chamber had eaten through what was left of his shoe and was now chomping on his foot. Richard tried to shake his leg vigorously, but noiselessly. He was not completely successful. Although the rodent released his foot, the soldiers heard the sound and started moving toward him. Richard could not run. Even if there had been an escape route, the extra weight he was carrying would have made him easy prey for the soldiers. Within a minute, one of the men yelled, Over here, Bruce! I think there's something in this thicket! The man was pointing his gun in Richard's direction. Don't shoot! Richard said. I'm a human! The second soldier had just joined his comrade. What the fuck you doing out here alone? I'm taking a hike, Richard answered. Are you crazy? The first soldier said. Come on out of there. Let's take a look at you. Richard slowly walked out of the underbrush. Even in the dim light he must have been an astonishing sight with his long hair and beard, plus the bulging blue jacket. Jesus Christ! Who the hell are you? Where's your outfit positioned? This ain't no goddamn soldier, the other man said, still staring at Richard. This here's a looney tune. He must have escaped from the facility in Avalon and wandered over here by mistake. Hey, asshole, don't you know this is dangerous territory? You could have been killed. Look at his pockets, the first soldier interrupted. He's carrying four huge goddamn melons. Suddenly, they struck from the sky. There must have been a dozen of the avians altogether, consumed by fury and shrieking as they attacked. The two human soldiers were knocked to the ground. Richard started to run, 
One of the avians landed on the face of the first soldier and began to tear it apart with its talons. Gunfire erupted as other soldiers in the vicinity, hearing the fracas, hurried into the area to help the patrol. Richard did not know how he was going to find the submarine. He raced downhill as fast as his feet and his load would allow him. The gunfire behind him increased. He heard the screams of pain of the soldiers and the death shrieks of the avians. He found the moat, but there was no sign of the submarine. Richard could hear human voices coming down the slope behind him. Just when he was about to panic, he heard a short shriek from a large bush on his right. The leader avian with the four cobalt rings flew past his head, not far off the ground, and continued down the shore of the moat to the left. They located the small submarine in three more minutes. The ship had already submerged before the pursuing humans broke into the clear in the green region. Inside, Richard took off his pack and placed it behind him in the small control compartment. He looked at his avian companion and tried a couple of simple jabber phrases. The avian leader replied, very slowly and very clearly, with the jabber equivalent of, We all thank you very much. The journey took slightly more than an hour. Richard and the avian said very little to each other. During the early part of the voyage, Richard carefully watched the avian leader operating the submarine. He made notes in his computer and, during the second half of the trip, even took over the controls himself for a short period of time. When he was not too busy, Richard's mind was asking questions about everything he had experienced in the second habitat. Above all, he wanted to know why it was he in the submarine with the melons, the avian eggs and the sessile slice, and not one of the myrmecats. I must be missing something, he mused to himself. Soon thereafter, the submarine surfaced, and Richard was in familiar territory. The skyscrapers of New York loomed above him. Hallelujah, Richard said out loud, carrying his full pack onto the island. The avian leader anchored the submarine just offshore and quickly prepared to leave. He turned around in a circle, bowed slightly to Richard, and then took off toward the north. As he was watching the bird-like creature fly away, Richard realized that he was standing in the exact spot where he and Nicole had waited many, many years before in Rama II for the three avians who would carry them across the cylindrical sea to freedom. Chapter 7 During the first second that Richard stood on the surface in New York, a hundred billion billion bits of data were acquired by the infinitesimal Raman sensors scattered throughout the giant cylindrical spacecraft. These data were transmitted in real time to local data handling centers, still microscopic in size, where they were stored until the allocated time for them to be relayed to the central telecommunications processor buried beneath the southern hemicylinder. Every second of every hour of every day, the Raman sensors acquire these hundred quintillion data bits. At the telecommunications processor, the data are labeled, sifted, analyzed, compressed, and stored in recording devices whose individual components are smaller than an atom. After storage, the data are accessed by the dozens of distributed processors, each managing a separate function that together control the Rama spacecraft. Thousands of algorithms spread among the processors, then operate on the data, extracting trend and synthesis information in preparation for the regularly scheduled data bursts that transmit the mission status to the nodal intelligence. The data bursts contain a mixture of raw, compressed, and synthesized data, depending on the exact formats selected by the different processors. The most important part of each burst is the narrative report, in which the unified but distributed intelligence of Rama presents its prioritized summary of the progress of the mission. The rest of the burst is essentially supporting information, images or measurements or sensor outputs that either provide additional background data or directly support the conclusions contained in the summary. The language used for the narrative summary is mathematical in structure, precise in definition, and highly coded. It is also rich in footnotes, each equivalent phrase or sentence containing, as part of its transmission structure, the pointers to the actual data buttressing the particular statement being made. The report could not, in the truest sense, be translated into any language as primitive as the ones used by human beings. Nevertheless, what follows is a crude approximation of the summary report received by the nodal intelligence from Rama soon after Richard's arrival in New York. Report number 298 Time of transmission, 156-307-872-491, point 
5116. Time since first stage alert. 29.2873. References. Node 23-419. Spacecraft 947. Spacefarers 47, 249, A and B. 32, 806, 2, 6, 6, 6. During the last interval, the humans, spacefarer number 32806, have continued to wage a successful war against the avian sessile symbiotic pair, number 47249-A and B. The humans now control almost all the interior of the avian sessile habitat, including the upper portion of the brown cylinder where the avians formerly lived. The avians have fought courageously but vainly against the human invasion. They have been killed unmercifully, and less than a hundred of them now remain. Thus far the humans have not breached the integrity of the sessile domain. They have, however, found the elevator shafts leading to the lower parts of the brown cylinder. The humans are currently developing plans for an attack on the sessile layer. The sessiles are a defenseless species. There are no weapons of any kind in their domain. Even their mobile form, which has the physical dexterity to use weapons, is essentially non-violent. To protect themselves from what they fear will be an inevitable invasion by the humans, the sessiles have directed the mobile myrmicats to build fortresses surrounding the four oldest and most developed of their species. Meanwhile. No more manor melons are being allowed to germinate, and those myrmicats not involved in the construction process are cocooning early. If the humans delay their attack several more intervals, as seems likely, it is possible they will encounter only a few myrmicats during their invasion. The human habitat continues to be dominated by individuals with characteristics decidedly different from the human contingent observed inside Rama II and at the node. The focus of the current human leaders is the retention of personal power, without serious consideration of the welfare of the colony. Despite both the video message and the presence of messenger humans in their group, these leaders must not believe they are actually being watched, for their behavior in no way reflects the possible existence of a set of values or ethical laws that supersedes their own dominion. The humans have continued to prosecute the war against the avian sessiles primarily because it distracts attention from the other problems in their colony, including the human-initiated environmental degradation and the recent precipitous decline in living standards. The human leaders, and indeed most of the colonists, have shown no remorse whatsoever over the destruction and possible extermination of the avians. The human family that remained for over a year at the node no longer has any significant impact on the affairs of the colony. The woman who was the primary messenger is still imprisoned, essentially because she opposes the actions of the existing leaders and is in danger of being executed. Her husband has been living with the avians and sessiles and is now a critical component in their attempt to survive the human onslaught. The children are not yet mature enough to be a major factor in the human colony. Very recently, the husband escaped from the sessile domain to the island in the middle of the spacecraft. He carried both avian and sessile embryos with him. He is currently located in a familiar environment, and therefore should be able both to survive and to nurture the young of the other species. His successful escape may have been at least partly due to the non-invasive intercession that began at the time of the first stage alert. The intercession signals almost certainly played a role in the decision by the sessiles to trust their embryos to a human being. There is no evidence, however, that the intercession transmissions have affected the behavior of any of the humans. For the sessiles, information processing is a primary activity and therefore it is not surprising that they would be susceptible to intercessionary suggestions. The humans, however, especially the leaders, have their lives so filled with activity that there is very little, if any, time for cogitation. There is an additional problem with humans and non-invasive intercession. As a species they are so varied from individual to individual that a transmission package cannot be designed with broad applicability. A set of signals that might result in a positive behavior modification for one human will almost certainly have no impact on anyone else. Experiments with different types of intercession processes are currently being conducted, but it may well be that humans belong to that small group of spacefarers who are immune to non-invasive intercession. In the south of the spacecraft, the octo-spiders, number 2666, continue to thrive in a colony almost indistinguishable from any of their other isolated colonies in space. 
the full range of possible biological expression remains latent, primarily because of restricted territorial resources and no true competition. However, they are carrying with them the significant potential for expansion that has characterized their several successful transfers from one star system to another. Until the humans probed through the wall of their own habitat and broke the seal on their enclosure, the octospiders paid very little attention to the other two species in the spacecraft. Since the humans began to explore, however, the octospiders have watched the events in the north with increasing interest. Their existence is still unknown to the humans, but the octospiders have already started formulating a contingency plan to cover a possible interaction with their aggressive neighbors. The potential loss of the entire avian sessile community greatly reduces the value of the mission. It is possible that the only sessile and avian survivors of the voyage will be those in the small octospider zoo and, perhaps, those raised by the human on the island. Even irrevocable loss of a single species does not call for a stage two alert. Nevertheless, the continued unpredictable and life-negative behavior of the current human leaders provides an unmitigated worry that the mission may suffer additional serious losses. Intercessionary activity in the near future will be focused on those humans who both oppose the present leaders and have indicated, by their behavior, growth beyond territorialism and aggression. Chapter 8 My country was called Thailand. It had a king, whose name was also Rama, like a spaceship. Your grandmother and grandfather, my mother and father, probably still live there, in a town called Lampun. Here it is. Nye pointed at a spot on the faded map. The boy's attention had started to wander. They're still too young, she thought. Even for bright children, it's too much to expect at four. All right now, she said, folding up the map. You can go outside and play. Galileo and Kepler put on their heavy jackets, picked up a ball, and raced out the door into the street. Within seconds, they were engaged in a one-on-one -on -one soccer match. Oh, Kenji, Nye thought, watching the boys from the entryway. How they have missed you. There's just no way one parent can be both mother and father. She had begun the geography lesson, as she always did, by reminding the boys that all of the colonists in New Eden had come originally from a planet called Earth. Nye had then shown the boys a world map for their home planet, first discussing the basic concept of continents and oceans, and then identifying Japan, their father's native country. The activity had made Nye both homesick and lonely. Maybe these lessons aren't for you at all, she thought, still watching the soccer game under the dim streetlights of Avalon. Galileo dribbled around Kepler and fired at an imaginary goal. Maybe they're really for me. Eponine was coming down the street in their direction. She picked up the ball and threw it back to the boys. Nye smiled at her friend. Oh, they'd like to see you, she said. I can definitely use a happy face today. What's the matter, Nye? Eponine asked. Life in Avalon getting you down? At least it's a Sunday. You're not working in the gun factory, and the boys aren't over at the centre. The two women walked inside. And certainly your living conditions cannot be the cause of your despair. Eponine waved her arm at the room. After all, you have a large room for the three of you, half a toilet, and a bath you share with five other families. What more could you want? Nye laughed and hugged Eponine. You're a big help she said. Mummy, mummy, Kepler was standing in the doorway a moment later. Come quickly, the little boy said. He's back, and he's talking to Galileo. Nye and Eponine returned to the door. A man with a severely disfigured face was kneeling down in the dirt next to Galileo. The boy was obviously frightened. The man was holding a sheet of paper in his gloved hand. On it, a large human face with long hair and a full beard had been carefully drawn. You know this face, don't you? the man said insistently. It's Mr. Richard Wakefield, isn't it? Nye and Eponine approached the man cautiously. We told you last time, Nye said firmly, not to bother the boys any more. Now go back to the ward, or we will call the police. The man's eyes were wild. I saw him again last night, he said. He looked like Jesus, but he was Richard Wakefield, all right. I started to shoot him, and they attacked me. Five of them. They tore my face apart. The man started to weep. An orderly came running down the street. He grabbed the man. I saw him, the wild man shouted as he was led away. I know I did. Please believe me, 
Galileo was crying. Nye bent down to comfort her son. Mama, the boy said, do you think that man really saw Mr. Wakefield? I don't know, she answered. Nye glanced at Eponine. But some of us would like to believe it. The boys had finally fallen asleep in their beds in the corner. Nye and Eponine sat next to each other in the two chairs. The rumour is she's very ill, Eponine said quietly. They hardly feed her at all. They make her suffer in every possible way. Nicole will never give up, Nye said proudly. I wish I had her strength and courage. Neither Ellie nor Robert has been allowed to see her for over six months. Nicole doesn't even know she has a granddaughter. Ellie told me last week that she has filed another petition with Nakamura to visit her mother, Nye said. I worry about Ellie. She continues to push very, very hard. Eponine smiled. Ellie is so wonderful, even if she is incredibly naive. She insists that if she obeys all the colony laws, Nakamura will leave her alone. That's not surprising, especially when you consider that Ellie still thinks her father is alive, Nye said. She has talked with every one of the people who claim to have seen Richard since he disappeared. All the stories about Richard give her hope, Eponine said. We can still use a dosage of hope from time to time. There was a momentary lull in the conversation. What about you, Eponine? Nye asked. Do you allow yourself? No, Eponine interrupted. I am always honest with myself. I am going to die soon. I just don't know when. Besides, why should I fight to keep living? Conditions here in Avalon are far worse than they were even in the detention camp at Bourges. If it weren't for the few children in the school... They both heard the noise outside the door at the same time. Nye and Eponine sat completely still. If their conversation had been recorded by one of Nakamura's roving biots, then... The door suddenly swung open. The two women nearly jumped out of their skins. Max Puckett stumbled in, grinning. You're under arrest, he said for engaging in seditious conversation. Max was carrying a large wooden box. The two women helped him place it in the corner. Max took off his heavy jacket. Sorry to show up so late, ladies, but I couldn't help it. Another food run to the troops, Nye asked in a soft voice. She pointed at the sleeping twins. Max nodded. The king Jap, he said in a lower voice, always reminds me that an army travels on its stomach. That was one of Napoleon's maxims. Eponine looked at Max with a sarcastic smile. I don't suppose you ever heard of him out there in Arkansas? Uh-oh, Max replied. The lovely lady teacher is in a smart-ass mood tonight. He pulled an unopened pack of cigarettes out of his shirt pocket. Maybe I should just keep her gift for myself. Eponine laughed and jumped up to grab the cigarettes. After a short, mock struggle, Max surrendered them to her. Thanks, Max. Eponine said, in a genuine manner. There aren't many pleasures allowed to those of us. Now look here, Max said, still grinning. I didn't come all the way out here to listen to you feeling sorry for yourself. I stopped in Avalon to be inspired by your beautiful face. If you're going to be depressed, I'll just take my corn and tomatoes. Corn and tomatoes! Nye and Eponine exclaimed in unison. The women ran over to the box. The children haven't had any fresh produce in weeks. Nye said excitedly, as Max opened the box with a steel bar. Be very, very careful with these, Max said seriously. You know that what I am doing is absolutely illegal. There's barely enough fresh food for the army and the government leaders, but I decided you deserve something better than leftover rice. Eponine gave Max a hug. Thank you, she said. The boys and I are very grateful, Max, Nye said. I don't know how we'll ever repay you. I'll find some way, Max said. The two women returned to their chairs, and Max sat down on the floor between them. Incidentally, he said, I ran into Patrick O'Toole over in the second habitat. He asked me to say hello to both of you. How is he? Eponine asked. Troubled, I would say, Max replied. When he was drafted, he let Katie talk him into reporting to the army, which I'm certain he would never have done if either Nicole or Richard could have spoken to him even once, and I think he realizes now what a mistake he made. He didn't say anything, but I could sense his distress. Nakamura keeps him in the front line because of Nicole. Is this war almost over? Eponine asked. I think so, Max said. But it's not clear the King Jap wants it to be over. 
From what the soldiers told me, there's very little resistance left. They're mostly mopping up inside the brown cylinder. Nye leaned forward. We heard a rumour that another intelligent species was also living in the cylinder. Something altogether different from the avians. Max laughed. Who knows what to believe? The television and newspaper say whatever Nakamura tells them, and everyone knows it. There are always hundreds of rumours. I myself have encountered some bizarre alien plants and animals inside that habitat, so nothing would surprise me. Nye stifled a yawn. I'd best be leaving, Max said, standing up, and let our hostess go to bed. He glanced at Eponine. Would you like someone to walk you home? Depends on who this someone is, Eponine said with a smile. A few minutes later, Max and Eponine reached her tiny hut on one of the side streets of Avalon. Max dropped the cigarette they had been sharing and ground it into the dirt. Would you like someone? he started. Yes, Max, of course I would. Eponine replied with a sigh. And if that someone were anyone, it would definitely be you. She looked directly in his eyes. But if you shared my bed, even one time, then I would want more. And if by some awful chance, no matter how careful we were, you were ever, ever to test positive for RV-41, I would never forgive myself. Eponine pressed herself against him to hide her tears. Thanks for everything, she said. You're a good man, Max Puckett. Maybe the only one left in this crazy universe. Eponine was in a museum in Paris, surrounded by hundreds of masterpieces. A large group of tourists passed through the museum. They spent a total of forty-five seconds looking at five magnificent paintings by Renoir and Monet. Stop, Eponine shouted in her dream. You can't possibly have seen them. The knocking on her door chased the dream away. It's us, Eponine, she heard Ellie say. If it's too early, we can try to come back later before you go to school. Robert was worried that we might get tied up in the psychiatric ward. Eponine leaned over and grabbed the robe hanging on the room's solitary chair. Just a minute, she said. I'm coming. She opened the door for her friends. Ellie was in her nurse's uniform, with little Nicole in a makeshift carrier on her back. The sleeping baby was wrapped cleverly in cotton to protect her from the cold. May we come in? Of course, replied Eponine. I'm sorry, she said. I must not have heard you. It's a ridiculous time for us to visit, Ellie said. But with all our work at the hospital, if we don't come out here early in the morning, we'd never make it. How have you been feeling? Dr. Turner asked a few seconds later. He was holding a scanner in front of Eponine, and data was already being displayed on the portable computer monitor. A little tired, Eponine said. But it could be just psychological. Since you told me two months ago that my heart was beginning to show some signs of degradation, I have imagined myself having a heart attack at least once a day. During the examination, Ellie operated the keyboard that was attached to the monitor. She made certain that the most important information from the checkup was recorded in the computer. Eponine craned around to see the screen. How's the new system working, Robert? We've had several failures with the probes, he replied. Ed Stafford says that's to be expected because of our inadequate testing, and we don't yet have a good data management system, but on the whole we're very pleased. It's been a saviour, Eponine. Ellie said, without glancing up from the keyboard. With our limited funds, and all the wounded from the war, there would have been no way we could have kept the RV-41 files current without this kind of automation. I only wish we had been able to use more of Nicole's expertise in the original design, Robert Turner said. I hadn't realized she was such an expert on internal monitoring systems. The doctor saw something unusual in a graph that appeared on the screen. Print a copy of that, will you, darling? I want to show it to Ed. Have you heard anything new about your mother? Eponine asked Ellie as the examination neared its completion. We saw Katie two nights ago, Ellie replied very slowly. It was a difficult evening. She had another deal from Nakamura and Macmillan she wanted to discuss. Her voice trailed off. Anyway, Katie says that there will definitely be a trial before settlement day. Has she seen Nicole? No, Ellie answered. As far as we know, nobody has. Her food is brought in by a Garcia, and her monthly checkups are done by a Tiasso. Baby Nicole stirred and whimpered on her mother's back. Eponine reached down and touched the portion of the child's cheek that was exposed to the air. 
They are so unbelievably soft, she said. At that moment, the little girl's eyes opened, and she began to cry. Do I have time to nurse her, Robert? Ellie asked. Dr. Turner glanced at his watch. All right, he said. We're basically finished here. Since both Wilma Margolin and Bill Tucker are in the next block, why don't I call on them by myself and then come back? You can handle them without me. With difficulty, he said grimly. Especially poor Tucker. Bill Tucker is dying very slowly, Ellie said to Eponine in explanation. He's alone and in great pain. But since the government has now outlawed euthanasia, there's nothing we can do. There's no indication of additional atrophy in your data, Dr. Turner said to Eponine a few moments later. I guess we should be thankful. She didn't hear him. In her mind's eye, Eponine was imagining her own slow and painful death. I will not let it happen that way, she told herself. Never. As soon as I am no longer useful, Max will bring me a gun. I'm sorry, Robert, she said. I must be sleepier than I thought. What did you say? You're no worse. Robert gave Eponine a kiss on the cheek and started for the door. I'll be back in about twenty minutes, he said to Ellie. Robert looks very tired, Eponine said when he departed. He is, Ellie replied. He still works all the time and worries when he's not working. Ellie was sitting on the dirt floor with her back against the wall of the hut. Nicole was cradled in her arms, suckling at her breast and cooing intermittently. That looks like fun, Eponine said. Nothing I have ever experienced is even remotely similar. The pleasure is indescribable. It's not for me, Eponine's inner voice said. Not now, not ever. In a fleeting moment, Eponine recalled a night of passion when she almost hadn't said no to Max Puckett. A deep feeling of bitterness welled up inside her. She struggled to fight it. I had a nice walk with Benji yesterday, she said, changing the subject. I'm sure he'll tell me all about it this morning, Ellie said. He loves his Sunday walks with you. It's all he has left, except for my occasional visits. You know that I am very grateful. Forget it. I like Benji. I also need to feel needed, if you know what I mean. Benji actually has adjusted surprisingly well. He doesn't complain as much as the Forty Ones, and certainly not as much as the people assigned here to work at the gun factory. He hides his pain, Ellie replied. Benji's much smarter than anyone thinks. He really dislikes the ward, but knows that he can't take care of himself, and he doesn't want to be a burden to anybody. Tears suddenly formed in Ellie's eyes, and her body trembled slightly. Baby Nicole stopped nursing and stared at her mother. Are you all right? Eponine asked. Ellie shook her head affirmatively and wiped her eyes with the small cotton cloth that she was holding next to her breasts to catch any leakage. Nicole resumed nursing. Suffering is difficult enough to watch, Ellie said. Unnecessary suffering tears your heart out. The guard looked carefully at their identification papers and handed them to another uniformed man sitting behind him at a computer console. The second man made an entry into the computer and returned the documents to the guard. Why, Ellie said, when they were out of earshot, does that man stare at our photographs every single day? He must have passed us through the checkpoint personally a dozen times in the last month. They were walking along the lane that led from the module exit to Positano. It's his job, Robert replied, and he likes to feel important. If he doesn't make a ceremony out of it each time, then we might forget the power he has over us. The process was much smoother when the Biots were handling the entrance. The ones that are still functioning are too critical to the war effort. Besides, Nakamura is afraid that the ghost of Richard Wakefield will appear and somehow confound the Biots. Besides, Nakamura is afraid that the ghost of Richard Wakefield will appear and somehow confound the Biots. They walked in silence for several seconds. You don't think my father is still alive, do you, darling? No, dear. Robert answered, after a short hesitation. He was surprised by the directness of the question. But even though I don't think he's alive, I still hope that he is. Robert and Ellie finally reached the outskirts of Positano. A few new houses, European in style, lined the lane that sloped gently down into the heart of the village. By the way, Ellie, Robert said, talking about your father reminds me of something I wanted to discuss with you. Do you remember that project I was telling you about? the one that Ed Stafford is doing. Ellie shook her head. 
He's trying to classify and categorize the entire colony in terms of general genetic groupings. He thinks that such classifications, even though they are completely arbitrary, may offer clues about which individuals are likely to have which diseases. I don't completely agree with his approach. It seems too forced and numerical, rather than medical. But parallel studies have been done on Earth, and they showed that people with similar genes do indeed have similar disease tendencies. Ellie stopped walking and looked at her husband quizzically. Why do you want to discuss this with me? Robert laughed. Yes, yes, he said. I'm coming to that. Anyway, Ed defined a difference matrix, a numerical method of measuring how different any two individuals are, using the way in which the four basic amino acids are chained in the genome, and then, as a test, divided all the citizens of New Eden into groups. Now, the metric didn't really mean anything. Robert Turner, Ellie interrupted. She was laughing. Will you please get to the point? What are you trying to tell me? Well, it's weird, he said. We don't quite know what to make of it. When Ed made his first classification structure, two of the people tested did not belong to any group. By fiddling with the definitions of the categories, he was eventually able to define a quantitative spread that covered one of them. But the amino acid chaining structure of the final person was so different from every other person in New Eden that she couldn't be placed into any of the groups. Ellie was staring at Robert as if he had lost his mind. The two individuals were your brother, Benji, and you, Robert concluded awkwardly. You were the one outside all the groupings. Should I be worried about this? Ellie said after they had walked another thirty meters in silence. I don't think so, Robert said casually. It's probably just an artifice of the particular metric that Ed chose, or perhaps a mistake was made. But it would be fascinating if somehow cosmic radiation might have altered your genetic structure during your embryological development. By this time they had arrived at the main square of Positana. Ellie leaned over and kissed her husband. That was very interesting, dear, she said, teasing him a little. But I must admit that I'm still not sure what it was all about. A large bicycle rack occupied most of the square. Two dozen rows and as many columns of parking positions were spread out over the area in front of what had been the train station. All the colonists, with the exception of the government leaders, who had electric cars, now used bicycles for transportation. The train service in New Eden had been discontinued soon after the war began. The trains had originally been constructed by the extraterrestrials from very light and exceptionally strong materials that the human factories in the colony had never been able to duplicate. These alloys were extremely valuable in many different military functions. By the middle stages of the war, therefore, the Defence Agency had requisitioned all the cars in the train system. Ellie and Robert rode their bicycles side by side along the banks of Lake Shakespeare. Little Nicole had awakened and was quietly watching the landscape around her. They passed the park, where the settlement day picnic was always held, and turned toward the north. Robert, Ellie said very seriously, have you thought any more about our long discussion last night? About Nakamura and politics? Yes, she answered. I still think we should both oppose his edict, suspending elections until after the war is over. You have a lot of stature in the colony. Most of the health professionals will follow your lead. Nye even thinks that the factory workers in Avalon might strike. I can't do it, Robert said after a long silence. Why not, darling? Ellie asked. Because I don't think it will work. In your idealistic view of the world, Ellie, people act out of commitment to principles or values. In reality, they don't behave that way at all. If we were to oppose Nakamura, the most likely result is that we would both be imprisoned. What would happen to our daughter? In addition, all the support for the RV-41 work would be withdrawn, leaving those poor people in even worse shape than they are. The hospital would be more short-handed. Many people would suffer because of our idealism. As a doctor, I find these possible consequences unacceptable. Ellie drove off the bicycle path into a small park about five hundred meters from the first buildings of Central City. Why are we stopping here? Robert asked. They're expecting us at the hospital. I want to take five minutes to see the trees, smell the flowers, and hug Nicole. After Ellie dismounted, Robert helped her disengage the baby carrier from her back. Ellie then sat on the grass with Nicole in her lap. Neither of the adults said anything while they watched Nicole study the three blades of grass that she had grabbed with her chubby hands. At length, Ellie spread out a blanket and laid her daughter gently upon it. 
She approached her husband and put her arms around his neck. I love you, Robert, very, very much, she said. But I must say that sometimes I do not agree with you at all. Chapter 9 The light from the solitary window in the cell made a pattern on the dirt wall opposite Nicole's bed. The bars on the window created a reflected square with a tic-tac-toe design, a near-perfect three-by-three matrix. The light in her cell signaled to Nicole that it was time to rise. She crossed the room from the wooden bunk on which she had been sleeping and washed her face in the basin. She then took a deep breath and tried to summon her strength for another day. Nicole was fairly certain that her latest prison, where she had been for about five months, was somewhere in the New Eden farming strip, between Hakone and San Miguel. She had been blindfolded when they had moved her the last time. Nicole had quickly concluded, however, that she was in a rural location. Occasionally a strong smell of animals drifted into her cell through the forty-centimetre-square window just below the ceiling. In addition, Nicole could see no reflected light of any kind outside the window when it was night in New Eden. These last months have been the worst, Nicole thought, as she stood on tiptoe to push a few grams of flavoured rice through the window. No conversation, no reading, no exercise. Two meals a day of rice and water. The little red squirrel who visited her each morning appeared outside. Nicole could hear him. She backed across the cell so she could see him eating the rice. You are my only company, my handsome friend, Nicole said out loud. The squirrel stopped eating and listened always alert for any possible danger. And you have never understood a single word that I have said. The squirrel didn't stay long. When he had finished eating his ration of rice, he departed, leaving Nicole alone. For several minutes she stared out the window where the squirrel had been, wondering what was happening with her family. Until six months earlier, when her trial for sedition had been indefinitely postponed at the last minute, Nicole had been allowed one visitor each week for one hour. Even though the conversation had been chaperoned by a guard and any discussion of politics or current events had been strictly prohibited, she had eagerly awaited those weekly sessions with Ellie or Patrick. Usually it had been Ellie who had come. From some very carefully worded statements by both her children, Nicole had deduced that Patrick was involved in some kind of government work and was only available at limited times. Nicole had been first angry and then depressed, when she had learned that Benji had been institutionalised and would not be permitted to see her. Ellie had tried to assure her mother that Benji was all right, considering the circumstances. There had been very little discussion of Katie. Neither Patrick nor Ellie had known how to explain to Nicole that their older sister had really shown no interest in visiting her mother. Ellie's pregnancy was always a safe topic of conversation during those early visits. Nicole was thrilled to touch her daughter's stomach, or to talk about the special feelings of a mother-to-be. If Ellie would mention how active the baby was, Nicole would share and compare her own experiences. When I was pregnant with Patrick, Nicole said one time, I was never tired. You, on the other hand, were a mother's nightmare, always thrashing around in the middle of the night when I wanted to sleep. If Ellie was not feeling well, Nicole would prescribe foods or physical activities that had helped her deal with the same conditions. Ellie's last visit had been two months before the due date for the baby. Nicole had been moved to her new cell the following week and had not talked to a human being since then. The mute biots who attended Nicole never gave any indication that they even heard her questions. Once, in a peak of frustration, she had shouted at the Tiasso giving her the weekly bath. Don't you understand, she had said. My daughter was supposed to have a baby, my grandchild, sometime last week. I need to know if they are all right. In her previous cells, Nicole had always been allowed to read. New book discs had been brought to her from the library whenever she had asked, so the days between visits had passed fairly quickly. She had reread almost all her father's historical novels, as well as some poetry, history, and a few of her more interesting medical books. Nicole had been especially fascinated by the parallels between her life and the lives of her two childhood heroines, Joan of Arc and Eleanor of Aquitaine. Nicole buttressed her own strength by noting that neither of the two other women allowed her basic attitudes to change, despite long and difficult periods in prison. Right after she was moved, when the Garcia who attended her in the new cell did not return her electronic reader with her personal effects, Nicole thought that a simple mistake had been made. However, after she asked for the reader several times and it still never appeared, 
she realized that she was now being denied the privilege of reading. The time passed very slowly for Nicole in her new cell. For several hours each day she deliberately paced about, trying to keep her body and mind active. She attempted to organize these pacing sessions, steering them away from thoughts about her family, which inevitably caused her feelings of loneliness and depression to intensify, and toward more general philosophic concepts or ideas. Often, at the conclusion of these sessions, she would focus on some past event in her life and try to derive some new or meaningful insight from it. During one such session, Nicole remembered sharply a sequence of events that had taken place when she was fifteen years old. By that time, she and her father were already comfortably ensconced at Beauvoir, and Nicole was performing brilliantly at school. She decided to enter the national competition to select three girls to play Joan of Arc in the set of pageants that would commemorate the 750th anniversary of the maid's martyrdom at Rouen. Nicole threw herself into the contest with a passion and single-mindedness that both thrilled and worried her father. After Nicole won the regional contest at Tours, Pierre even stopped working on his novels for six weeks to help his beloved daughter prepare for the national finals at Rouen. Nicole placed first in both the athletic and intellectual components of the contest. She even scored very high in the acting evaluations. She and her father had been certain that she was going to be selected. But when the winners were announced, Nicole had been a second runner-up. For years, Nicole thought, as she walked around her cell in New Eden, I thought that I had failed. What my father said about France not being ready for a copper-skinned Joan of Arc did not matter. In my mind I was a failure. I was devastated. My self-esteem did not really recover until the Olympics, and then it was only a few days before Henry knocked me down again. The price was terrible, Nicole continued. I was completely self-absorbed for years because of my lack of self-esteem. It was much later before I was finally happy with myself, and only then was I able to give to others. She paused a moment in her thoughts. Why is it that so many of us go through the same experience? Why is youth so selfish? And why must we first find ourselves to realize how much more there is to life? When the Garcia, who always brought her meals, included some fresh bread and a few raw carrots with her dinner, Nicole suspected that there was about to be a change in her regimen. Two days later, the Tiasso came into her cell with a portable bathtub, a hairbrush, some makeup, a mirror, and even a small bottle of perfume. Nicole took a long, luxurious bath and freshened herself for the first time in months. As the buyout picked up the wooden tub and prepared to leave, it handed her a note. You will have a visitor tomorrow morning, the note said. Nicole could not sleep. In the morning she chattered like a little girl to her friend the squirrel, discussing both her hopes and her anxieties about the coming rendezvous. She fussed with her face and hair several times before declaring both of them to be hopeless. The time went by very slowly. At long last, just before lunch, she heard human footsteps coming down the corridor toward her cell. Nicole rushed forward expectantly. Katie, she yelled when she saw her daughter walking around the final corridor. Hello, mother, Katie said, unlocking the door and entering the cell. The two women hugged for many seconds. Nicole did not try to restrain the tears that were pouring from her eyes. They sat on Nicole's bed, the only furniture in the cell, and talked amiably for several minutes about the family. Katie informed Nicole that she had a new granddaughter. Nicole de Jardin Turner, she said. You should be very proud. And then pulled out about twenty photographs. The pictures included recent snapshots of the baby with her parents, Ellie and Benji together in a park somewhere, Patrick in a uniform, and even a couple of Katie in an evening dress. Nicole studied them, one by one, her eyes brimming repeatedly. Oh, Katie, she exclaimed several times. When she was finished, Nicole thanked her daughter profusely for having brought the photographs. You can have them, mother, Katie said, standing up and walking over to the window. She opened her purse and pulled out cigarettes and a lighter. Darling, Nicole said hesitantly, would you please not smoke in here? The ventilation is terrible. I would smell it for weeks. Katie stared at her mother for a few seconds and then placed her cigarettes and lighter back in her purse. At that moment a pair of Garcias arrived outside the cell with a table and two chairs. "'What's this?' Nicole asked. Katie smiled. "'We're going to have lunch together,' she said. "'I've had something special prepared for the occasion. Chicken in a mushroom and wine sauce.'
The food, which smelled divine, was soon carried into the cell by a third Garcia, and placed on the covered table beside the fine china and silver. There was even a bottle of wine and two crystal glasses. It was difficult for Nicole to remember her manners. The chicken was so delicious, the mushrooms so tender, that she ate her meal without talking. Every so often, when she took a swallow of the wine, Nicole would murmur, Mmm, or This is fantastic. But she basically said nothing until her plate was completely clean. Katie, who had become a very light eater, nibbled at her food and watched her mother. When Nicole was finished, Katie called in a Garcia to take away the dishes and bring some coffee. Nicole had not had a good cup of coffee for almost two years. So, Katie, Nicole said with a warm smile after thanking her for the meal. How about you? What are you doing with yourself? Katie laughed coarsely. Same old shit, she said. I'm now director of entertainment for the whole Vegas resort. I book all the acts into the clubs. Business is great, even though... Katie caught herself, remembering that her mother knew nothing of the war in the second habitat. Have you found a man who can appreciate all your attributes? Nicole asked tactfully. Not one who will stay around. Katie was self-conscious about her answer, and suddenly became agitated. Look, mother, she said, leaning across the table. I didn't come here to discuss my love life. I have a proposition for you. Or rather... The family has a proposition for you that we all support. Nicole looked at her daughter with a puzzled frown. She noticed for the first time that Katie had aged considerably in the two years since she had last seen her. I don't understand, Nicole said. What kind of a proposition? Well, as you may know, the government has been preparing its case against you for some time. They are now ready to go to trial. The charge, of course, is sedition, which carries a mandatory death penalty. The prosecutor has told us that the evidence against you is overwhelming and that you are certain to be convicted. However, because of your past services to the colony, if you will plead guilty to the lesser charge of involuntary sedition, he will drop... But I am not guilty of anything, Nicole said firmly. I know that, mother, Katie replied with a trace of impatience. But we, Ellie, Patrick and I, all agree that there is a high likelihood that you will be convicted. The prosecutor has promised us that if you will simply plead guilty to the reduced charge, you will be moved immediately to nicer surroundings and allowed to visit with your family, including your new granddaughter. He even hinted that he might intercede with the authorities to allow Benji to live with Robert and Ellie. Nicole was in turmoil. And all of you think that I should accept this plea bargain and acknowledge my guilt, even though I have steadfastly proclaimed my innocence since the moment I was arrested. Katie nodded. We don't want you to die, she said especially for no reason. For no reason? Nicole's eyes suddenly flashed. You think I would be dying for no reason? She pushed away from the table, stood up, and paced around the cell. I would be dying for justice, Nicole said, more to herself than to Katie. In my mind, at least, even if there is not a single soul anywhere else in the universe who can understand it. But, Mother, Katie now interjected, what purpose would it serve? Your children and granddaughter would be deprived forever of your company. Benji would remain in that foul institution. So now, here's the deal, Nicole interrupted, her voice rising. A more insidious version of Faust's pact with the devil. Abandon your principles, Nicole, and acknowledge your guilt, even though you have not transgressed at all. And do not sell your soul for mere personal earthly reward. No, that would be too easy to reject. You are asked to take the deal because your family will benefit. Can there be any possible appeal to a mother that is more likely to sway her? Nicole's eyes were on fire. Katie reached into her purse, pulled out a cigarette, and lit it with a trembling hand. And who is it that comes to me with such a proposition? Nicole continued. She was now shouting. Who brings me delicious food and wine and pictures of my family to soften me up for the self-inflicted knife that will surely kill me with much more pain than any electric chair? Why, it is my own daughter, the beloved issue of my womb. Nicole suddenly moved forward and grabbed Katie. Do not play Judas for them, Katie, Nicole said, shaking her frightened daughter. You are so much better than that. In time, if they convict and execute me on these specious charges, you will appreciate what I am doing. Katie freed herself from her mother's grasp and staggered backward. She took a drag from her cigarette. This is bullshit, mother, she said a moment later. Total bullshit. You're just being our usual self-righteous. Look! I came here to help you, to offer you a chance to go on living. Why can't you listen to someone else just one time in your goddamn life?
Nicole stared at Katie for several seconds. Her voice was softer when she spoke again. I have been listening to you, Katie, and I do not like what I have heard. I have also been watching you. I don't think for a moment that you came here today to help me. That would be completely inconsistent with what I have seen of your character these last few years. There must be something in all this for you. Nor do I believe that you in any way represent Ellie and Patrick. If that were the case, they would have come with you. I must confess that for a while earlier I was confused and feeling that perhaps I was causing too much pain for all my children. But in these last few minutes I have seen what is going on here very clearly. Katie, my dear Katie, don't you touch me again! Katie shouted as Nicole approached her. Katie's eyes were full of tears. And spare me your self-righteous pity! The cell was momentarily quiet. Katie finished her cigarette and tried to compose herself. Look, she said at length, I don't give a shit what you feel about me. That's not important. But why, mother? Why can't you think about Patrick and Ellie and even little Nicole? Is being a saint so important to you that they should suffer because of it? In time, Nicole replied, they will understand. In time, Katie said angrily, you'll be dead. In a very short time. Do you realize that the moment I walk out of here and tell Nakamura that there's no deal, the date for your trial will be set? And that you have no chance at all? Absolutely no fucking chance? You cannot scare me, Katie. I cannot scare you. I cannot touch you. I cannot even appeal to your judgment. Like all good saints, you listen to your own voices. Katie took a deep breath. Then I guess this is it. Goodbye, mother. Despite herself, fresh tears appeared in Katie's eyes. Nicole wept openly. Goodbye, Katie, she said. I love you. Chapter 10 The defense may now make its closing statement. Nicole rose from her chair and walked around the table. She was surprised that she was so tired. The two years in prison had definitely diminished her legendary stamina. She slowly approached the jury of four men and two women. The woman in the front row, Karen Stoltz, had been originally from Switzerland. Nicole had known the woman fairly well when Mrs. Stoltz and her husband had owned and operated the bakery around the corner from the Wakefield home in Beauvoir. Hello again, Karen, Nicole said quietly, stopping directly in front of the jurors. They were sitting in two rows of three seats each. Our John and Marie, and they must be teenagers now. Mrs. Stoltz squirmed in her seat. They're fine, Nicole she replied very softly. Nicole smiled. And do you still make those wonderful cinnamon rolls every Sunday morning? The crack of the gavel resounded through the courtroom. Mrs. Wakefield, Judge Nakamura said, this is hardly the time for small talk. Your closing statement is limited to five minutes, and the clock has already started. Nicole ignored the judge. She leaned across the barrier between her and the jury, her eyes focusing on a magnificent necklace around Karen Stoltz's neck. The jewels are beautiful, she said in a whisper, but they would have paid much, much more. Again, the gavel cracked. Two guards quickly approached Nicole, but she had already backed away from Mrs. Stoltz. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Nicole said, all this week you have listened as the prosecution has repeatedly insisted that I have incited resistance to the legitimate government of New Eden. For my putative actions, I have been charged with sedition. You must now decide, on the basis of the evidence presented at this trial, if I am guilty. Please remember, as you deliberate, that sedition is a capital offence. A guilty verdict carries with it a mandatory death penalty. In my closing statement, I would like to examine carefully the structure of the prosecution's case. The testimony on the first day all of which was totally irrelevant to the charges against me and, I believe, was permitted by Judge Nakamura in clear violation of the colony codicils covering testimony in capital offence trials. Mrs. Wakefield, Judge Nakamura angrily interrupted, as I have told you before this week, I cannot tolerate such disrespectful comments in my courtroom. One more similar remark and I will not only cite you for contempt, I will also terminate your closing statement altogether. That entire day, the prosecution attempted to show that my sexual morality was questionable, and that therefore I was somehow a likely candidate to engage in political conspiracy, Nicole continued, without so much as glancing at the judge. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I would be happy to discuss privately with you the unusual circumstances associated with the conception of each of my six children. However, my sex life, past, present, or even future, has no bearing whatsoever on this trial, except for its possible value as entertainment. That first day of testimony was absolutely meaningless. There were a few titters in the packed gallery, but the guards quickly quieted the crowd. The prosecution's next set of witnesses, Nicole continued, spent many hours implicating my husband for seditious activities. I freely admit that I am married to Richard Wakefield, but his guilt, or lack of it for that matter, is not of any importance at this trial either. Only evidence that purports to show me guilty of sedition is germane to your verdict here. The prosecution has suggested that my seditious acts originated with my involvement in the video that eventually resulted in the establishment of this colony. I acknowledge that I did help prepare the video that was transmitted from Rama to the earth, but I categorically deny that I either conspired from the beginning with the aliens or in any way schemed with the extraterrestrials who built this spaceship against my fellow humans. I participated in the making of that video as I indicated yesterday when I allowed the prosecutor to cross-examine me because I felt I had no choice. My family and I were at the mercy of an intelligence and power far beyond anything any of us had ever imagined. There was a significant concern that failure to accede to their request for help with the video would have resulted in reprisals against us. Nicole returned to the defence table briefly and drank some water. She then turned around to face the jury again. That leaves only two possible sources for any real evidence to convict me of sedition. My daughter Katie's testimony, and that strange audio recording, a disjointed collection of comments that I made to other members of my family after I was imprisoned, that you heard yesterday morning. You are all well aware how easily recordings like that can be twisted and manipulated. The two key audio technicians both admitted yesterday on the witness stand that they had listened to hundreds of hours of conversation between my children and me before coming up with that thirty minutes of damaging evidence, no more than eighteen seconds of which were taken from any single conversation. To say that my comments on that recording were presented out of context would be an understatement. With respect to the testimony of my daughter, Katie Wakefield, I can only say, with great sorrow, that she lied repeatedly in her original remarks. I have not ever had any knowledge of my husband Richard's supposedly illegal activities, and I have certainly never supported him in them. You recall that under cross-examination by me, Katie became confused about the facts and ultimately repudiated her earlier testimony before collapsing on the witness stand. The judge has advised you that my daughter has recently been in fragile mental health and that you should ignore the comments she made under emotional duress during my questioning. I beseech you to remember every word that Katie said, not only when the prosecutor was asking her questions, but also during the time that I was trying to obtain the specific dates and places for the seditious actions that she has ascribed to me. Nicole approached the jurors one final time, carefully making eye contact with each of them. Ultimately, you must judge where the truth lies in this case. I face you now with a heavy heart, disbelieving even as I stand here the events that have led to my being accused of these serious crimes. I have served both the colony and the human species well. I am not guilty of any of the charges against me. Whatever power or intelligence exists in this amazing universe will recognize that fact, regardless of the outcome of this trial. The outside light was fading quickly. A contemplative Nicole leaned against the wall in her cell, wondering if this would be the last night of her life. She shuddered involuntarily. Since the verdict had been announced, Nicole had gone to sleep each night, expecting to die the next day. The Garcia brought her dinner soon after it was dark. The food had been much better the last few days. As she slowly ate her grilled fish, Nicole reflected on the five years since she and her family had met that first scouting party from the Pinta. What went wrong here? Nicole asked herself. What were our fundamental mistakes? She could hear Richard's voice in her head. Always cynical and distrustful of human behaviour, he had suggested at the end of the first year that New Eden was too good for humanity. We'll eventually ruin it, as we have the Earth, he had said. Our genetic baggage, the whole bit, you know, territorialism and aggression and reptilian behaviour, is too strong for education and enlightenment to overcome. 
Look at O'Toole's heroes, both of them, Jesus and that young Italian, St. Michael of Siena. They were destroyed because they suggested that humans should try to be more than clever chimpanzees. But here, in New Eden, Nicole thought, there was so much opportunity for a better world. The basics of life were provided. We were surrounded by unambiguous evidence that there was intelligence in the universe far beyond ours. That should have produced an environment in which... She finished her fish and pulled the small chocolate pudding over in front of her. Nicole smiled to herself, remembering how much Richard had loved chocolate. I have missed him very much, she thought, especially his conversation and his insight. Nicole was startled to hear footsteps coming toward her cell. A deep chill of fear coursed through her body. Her visitors were two young men, each of them carrying lanterns. They were wearing the uniforms of Nakamura's special police. The men came into the cell in a very businesslike manner. They did not introduce themselves. The older one, probably in his mid-thirties, quickly pulled out a document and began to read. Nicole de Jardin Wakefield, he said. You have been convicted of the crime of sedition, and you will be executed at 0800 tomorrow morning. Your breakfast will be served at 6.30, ten minutes after first light, and we will come to take you to the execution chamber at 7.30. You will be strapped into the electric chair at 0758, and current will be applied exactly two minutes later. Do you have any questions? Nicole's heart was beating so rapidly she could hardly breathe. She struggled to calm herself. Do you have any questions? The policeman repeated. What is your name, young man? Nicole asked, her voice breaking. France, the man answered after a puzzled hesitation. France what? Nicole said. Franz Bauer, he replied. Well, Franz Bauer, Nicole said, trying to force a smile. Can you please tell me how long it will take me to die? After you apply the current, of course. I don't really know, he said, somewhat flustered. You'll lose consciousness almost instantly, in just a couple of seconds. But I don't know how long... Thank you, Nicole said, starting to feel faint. Could you go now, please? I would like to be alone. The two men opened the door to the cell. Oh, by the way, Nicole added, could you possibly leave the lantern? And maybe a pen and paper? Or even an electronic notebook? Franz Bauer shook his head. I'm sorry, he said. We cannot. Nicole waved him away and crossed to the far side of her cell. Two letters, she said to herself, breathing slowly to gather strength. I only wanted to write two letters. One to Katie and one to Richard. I've made my final peace with everyone else. After the policeman had departed, Nicole recalled the long hours that she had spent in the pit in Rama II many years before, when she had expected to die from starvation. She had passed what she had then thought were her last days, reliving the happy moments of her life. That's not necessary now, she thought. There is no event from my past that has not been thoroughly scrutinized already. That's the benefit of two years in prison. Nicole was surprised to discover that she was angry about not being able to write the final two letters. I'll bring the subject up again in the morning. They'll let me write the letters if I make enough noise. Despite herself, Nicole smiled. Do not go gently, she quoted out loud. Suddenly, she felt her pulse rate increase again. In her mind's eye, Nicole saw an electric chair in a dark room. She was sitting in it. A strange helmet was wrapped around her head. The helmet began to glow and Nicole saw herself slump forward. Dear God, she thought, wherever and whatever you are, please give me some courage now. I am very frightened. Nicole sat down on her bed in the darkness of her room. In a few minutes she felt better, almost calm. She found herself wondering what the instant of death would be like. Is it just like going to sleep, and then there's nothing? Or does something special happen at that very last moment? something that no living person can ever know. There was a voice calling her from far away. Nicole stood, but did not wake up completely. Mrs. Wakefield, the voice called again. Nicole sat up quickly in her bed, thinking it was morning. She felt a surge of fear as her mind told her that she had only two more hours to live. Mrs. Wakefield, the voice said, over here, outside your cell. It's Amadou Diaba. Nicole rubbed her eyes and strained to see the figure in the dark by the door. Who? she said, slowly walking across the room. Amadou Diaba, 
Two years ago, you helped Dr. Turner do my heart transplant. What are you doing here, Amadou? And how did you get inside? I came to bring you something. I bribed everybody necessary. I had to see you. Even though the man was only five meters away from her, Nicole could see only his vague outline in the darkness. Her tired eyes were playing tricks on her as well. Once, when she tried especially hard to focus, she momentarily thought her visitor was her great-grandfather Omer. A sharp chill raced through her body. All right, Amadou, Nicole said at length. What is it that you have brought me? I must explain it first, he said. And even then, it may not make any sense. I don't understand it fully myself. I just know that I had to bring it to you tonight. He paused a moment. When Nicole did not say anything, Amadou told his story very rapidly. The day after I was selected for Lowell Colony, while I was still in Lagos, I received a strange message from my Sanufo grandmother, telling me that it was very urgent that I come to see her. I went at my first opportunity, which was two weeks later, after I had received still another message from my grandmother insisting that my visit was a matter of life and death. When I arrived at her village in the Ivory Coast, it was the middle of the night. My grandmother awakened and dressed immediately. Accompanied by our village medicine man, we took a long trek across the savannah that very night. I was exhausted by the time we reached our destination, a little village named Nidugu. Nidugu? Nicole interrupted. That's right, Amadou replied. Anyway, there was a strange, wizened man there who must have been some kind of super shaman. My grandmother and our medicine man stayed in Ndugu while this man and I made the strenuous climb up a nearby barren mountain to the side of a small lake. We arrived just before sunrise. Look, the old man said, when the first rays of the sun hit the lake. Look into the lake of wisdom. What do you see? I told him I saw thirty or forty melon-like objects resting on the bottom of one side of the lake. Good, he said with a smile. You... I indeed the one. I am the one what? I asked. He never answered. We walked around the lake, nearer to where the melons had been submerged. We couldn't see them any longer as the sun rose higher in the sky. And the super shaman pulled out a small vial. He dipped it into the water, put a cap on it, and handed it to me. He also gave me a small stone, which looked and was shipped like the melon-like objects on the bottom of the lake. These are the most important gifts you will ever receive, he said. Why? I said. A few seconds later, his eyes became completely white and he fell into a trance, chanting in rhythmic sanufu. He danced for several minutes and then suddenly jumped into the cold lake for a swim. Wait a minute, I shouted. What shall I do with your gifts? Take them with you everywhere, he said. You will know the time to use them. Nicole thought that the beating of her heart was so loud that even Amadou could hear it. She extended her arm through the bars of her cell and touched his shoulder. And last night, she said, a voice in a dream, or maybe it wasn't a dream after all, told you to bring the vial and the stone to me tonight. Exactly, Amadou said. He paused. How did you know? Nicole did not answer. She could not speak. Her entire body was trembling. Moments later, when Nicole felt the two objects in her hand, her knees were so weak that she thought she was going to fall. She thanked Amadou twice and urged him to leave before he was discovered. She walked slowly across the cell to her bed. Can it be? And how can it be? All this somehow known from the beginning? Manor melons on the earth? Nicole's system was overloaded. I have lost control, she thought, and I have not even drunk from the vial yet. Just holding the vial and the stone reminded Nicole vividly of the incredible vision she had experienced at the bottom of the pit in Rama too. Nicole opened the vial. She took two deep breaths and swallowed its contents hurriedly. At first she thought nothing was happening. The blackness all around her did not seem to change. Then, suddenly, a great orange ball formed in the middle of the cell. It exploded, spreading color all across the darkness. A red ball followed, then a purple one. While Nicole was recoiling from the brilliance of the purple explosion, she heard a loud laugh outside her window. She glanced in that direction. The cell disappeared. <laughs>
Nicole was outside in a field. It was dark, but she could still see outlines of objects. Off in the distance, Nicole heard the laugh again. Amadou, she called in her mind. Nicole raced across the field at blinding speed. She was catching the man. As she drew closer, his face changed. It was not Amadou at all. It was Omer. He laughed again, and Nicole stopped. Renata, he called. His face was growing. Larger, ever larger. It was as big as a car, then as big as a house. His laughter was deafening. Omer's face was a huge balloon, rising high, ever higher into the dark night. He laughed once more, and his balloon face exploded, showering Nicole with water. She was drenched. She was submerged, swimming underneath the water. When Nicole surfaced, she was in the oasis pond in the Ivory Coast, where, as a seven-year-old girl, she had confronted the lioness during the poro. The same lioness was prowling the perimeter of the pond. Nicole was a little girl again. She was very frightened. I want my mother, Nicole thought. Lay thee down now and rest. May thy slumber be blessed, she sang. Nicole started to walk out of the water. The lioness did not bother her. Nicole glanced at the animal once more, and the face of the lioness had changed into the face of her mother. Nicole ran over to embrace her mother. Instead, Nicole became the lioness herself, prowling on the shore of the oasis pond in the middle of the African savanna. There were now six swimmers altogether in the pond, all children. As lioness Nicole continued to sing the Brahms lullaby, one by one the children emerged from the water. Genevieve was first, then Simone, Katie, Benji, Patrick, and Ellie. Each of them walked past her, heading into the savanna. Nicole raced after them. She was running on an infield in a packed stadium, Nicole was a human again, young and athletic. Her final jump was announced. As she headed for the top of the triple jump runway, a Japanese judge approached her. It was Toshio Nakamura. You are going to foul, he said with a scowl. Nicole thought she was flying as she sped down the approach. She hit the board perfectly, soared into the air on her hop, executed a balanced skip, and powered far out into the pit with her jump. She knew it had been a good one. Nicole bounded over to where she had left her warm-ups. Her father and Henry both came over to give her a hug. Well done, they said in unison. Very well done. Joan of Arc brought the gold medal to the victory stand and hung it around Nicole's neck. Eleanor of Aquitaine handed her a dozen roses. Kenji Watanabe and Judge Mishkin stood beside her and offered their congratulations. The announcer said that her jump was a new world record. The crowd was giving her a standing ovation, Nicole looked out at the sea of faces and noticed that there weren't just humans in the crowd. The eagle was there, in a special box, sitting beside an entire section of octo-spiders. Everyone was saluting her, even the avians and the spherical creatures with the gossamer tentacles and the dozen caped eels pressed against the window of a gigantic enclosed bowl. Nicole waved to them all. Her arms changed to wings and she began to fly. Nicole was a hawk, soaring high above the farming strip in New Eden. She looked down on the building where she had been imprisoned. Nicole turned west and found Max Puckett's farm. Even though it was the middle of the night, Max was outside, working on what appeared to be an addition to one of his barns. Nicole continued to fly west, heading toward the bright lights of Vegas. She descended when she reached the complex, flying behind the big nightclubs one by one. Katie was sitting outside on some back steps, all by herself. She had her face buried in her hands, and her body was shaking. Nicole tried to comfort her, but the only sound was a hawk's cry in the night. Katie looked up at the sky, puzzled. She flew over to Positano, near the habitat exit, and waited for the outside door to open. Startling the guard, Hawk Nicole departed from New Eden. She reached Avalon in less than a minute. Robert, Ellie, little Nicole, and even an orderly were all in the lounge with Benji in the ward. Nicole had no idea why they were all awake in the middle of the night. She cried to them. Benji came over to the window and gazed out into the darkness. Nicole heard a voice calling her. It was faint, far to the south. She flew rapidly to the second habitat, entering through the gaping hole that the humans had cut into the exterior wall. After speeding through the annulus and finding a portal, she soared over the green region in the interior. She could no longer hear the voice, but Nicole could see her son Patrick 
camped with other soldiers near the base of the brown cylinder. An avian with four cobalt rings met her in midair. He's not here any more, it said. Try New York. Nicole exited quickly from the second habitat and returned to the central plain. She heard the voice again. Up, up she went. Hawk Nicole could barely breathe. She flew south over the perimeter wall, enclosing the northern hemicylinder. The cylindrical sea was below her. The voice was now more distinct. It was Richard. Her hawk heart was pounding furiously. He was standing on the shore, in front of the skyscrapers, waving at her. Come to me, Nicole, his voice said. She could see his eyes even in the dark. Nicole flew down and landed on Richard's shoulder. There was blackness around her. Nicole was back in her cell. Was that a bird she heard flying just outside her window? Her heart was still fluttering. She walked across the small room. Thank you, Amadou, she said. Or Omer. She smiled. Or God. Nicole stretched out on her bed. A few seconds later, she was asleep. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.